Like, what is going on in this John Elvis yeah. game? One point Whoa. away, the Phoenix are one point away from winning, and Elvis. Whoa! What? The last Rook couple moves have been crazy. Yeah, they have traded queens in a very funny way. Rook takes d6, both queens were hanging. And now rook c7. Ooh, this looks... Pin on the seventh rank. Okay. Well, this is a pawn up for white to start with. And he also has quite some initiative with this pin on the seventh rank and very active pieces. It has to be a winning position for yeah. white. Unless he steps into some a fork because there are still knights on the board and the knight is such a dangerous piece. A4, A5, A6 feels like a pretty good plan. Yeah, supported by the pair of bishops. Ooh, like, I like that move though. Bishop F6? Yeah, because now you want to play bishop D8 and try to stop uh -huh. the pawn's progress. But if I go... Yeah, I can't go A5, bishop D8 looks good. Although, A5, bishop D8, A6. Like if you take my rook, oh, go A7. Oh, I just took on H6 simply, the pawn. Okay, that's it. Knight's two pawns are for white. Yeah, but uh, this still, I don't really care as much about the H1 because now bishop B6 is really going to annoy me. Pins my knight, threatens knight g4. Rook b6 wins the b3 pawn. I don't mm -hmm. think Elvis is going to win this game. I really don't think he's yeah. going to win this game. You might be right, because now Black is taking on b3, so he's going to get back one of the pawns. And uh, with the bishop on d8, he's controlling the a5 squared, so that you can't go and advance the a5 pawn further. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Welcome to, well, you haven't seen me in a long time, but I may look a little bit different. Let's start there. But if you still remember me, I'm Grandmaster Robert Hess here with International Master Anna Rudolph. Anna, always, always, always a pleasure for me to commentate alongside with you. Always a pleasure for me, Robert, and I have been shocked by this sudden change of look. I was going to compliment Robert on his beard because I thought it was a really cool new style, but Robert decided that he had time. Like, how many hours have passed since the broadcast was over? Your one with Levy, Robert? It was over like, you know, nine hours ago, maybe, I think, not even. Yeah, so normally people would use those nine hours to have dinner and sleep, but Robert decided that he also had a chance to change his look and uh, there we go with the totally new Robert for today and this is the Eastern Division week five of the Pro Chess League where the games are about to begin. Hello to everyone and good morning, good afternoon, good evening depending on your country where you are watching us from. Yeah, uh, 
it's 10 a.m. in New York City. So that for me is you know, it's early. I, I know a lot of people yeah. will not believe that, especially those who will be watching from work because I know mm -hmm. people do that. Don't act like you only work all day. <laughs> don't act like you don't. <laughs> hey, look, Cash Mackey's here. What's up, Cash Mackey? I owe you a response to your email. I know, I know. I know you don't, <laughs> you don't even have to say it. I just thought about it in between the commentary last night while you were present and you commenting right there. My bad, I got you. Is this the way to get Robert answer work mails? Like come in the Twitch chat, tell him to <laughs> pay attention. Yep. Yeah, it's fun. It's fun. And uh, it's also early for me, even though it's, I believe, noon at the moment. It's, uh, yeah, it's 12 o'clock in Chile. And normally that shouldn't be too early. But hey, we are chess players. So I'm a night owl. Yeah, so am I. Total night owl. It's really bad mm -hmm. sometimes, especially when I have to force myself to go to sleep earlier just so I can wake up early and put a smile on my face. But it's easy to do when Anna Rudolph is commentating with you. Thank you so much, Robert. I've got so many compliments already this morning from Robert that I'm turning as red as my polo. Mm. But talking of turning red, uh, what happened last night in a match I was going to ask between the Dallas Destiny and the San Diego Surfers? Robert, can you just recap for those who may have missed this record result yeah that was absolutely ridiculous that match because it was 14 to 2 and you know the surfers I, I don't even know can you can't really do anything to water like fire doesn't work against water <laughs> but something went terribly wrong and the Dallas destiny just stomped all over them 14 to 2 finish I've never seen a match so lopsided in my recent history in the pro chess league yeah, it's a, such an impressive score and taking into account that three of the surfers are above 2,500 and they barely scored. Uh, Michael Brown going zero out of four. Uh, Malik Sadhachiang half a point out of four. The board for zero out of the four games and only the top board, Alexei Dreyev scored one and a half out of four. So it, it was a really disastrous round for the San Diego surfers. And what an amazing performance by the Dallas Destiny, of course. Yeah, no, that was unbelievable. And really, last night, the only close matchup was the San Jose Hackers. I almost called them the Slackers. I made that mistake yesterday. <laughs> but the San Jose... Oh, uh, yeah, well, our workplace. <laughs> we live on Slack here at chess.com. It's very true. And they were playing the Seattle Sluggers, right? So you take the SL start and you just add the Hackers there. You get the Slackers. So yeah. that was a drawn match, 8-8. Eight to eight. Oh, I have a Hikaru. Mm -hmm. I thought the game started, but it's me just following Hikaru. You know, it can never go wrong. Oh, is Hikaru playing at the moment? Yeah, he is playing bullet chess against Arthur 0208, and he's up 9-1 to one in their little bullet match. So you will... He's also streaming, so I guess some of you guys will be watching Hikaru streaming Blitz and Puzzle Rush. But hey, you can open both windows. We are here as well, and this is the Proteus League Eastern Division. I think uh, the main storyline here will be about the top two teams that uh, that is the Tbilisi gentlemen being in clear first place after an amazing battle royale performance they scored 20 and a half points out of the possible 24 game points and they are the only team that have passed a hundred points they have collected more than 100 points in four weeks which is really really impressive the second place team is the Armenian Eagles the defending champions they have 89 and a half points there's quite a gap between these two teams uh, but I think we will be looking at these two teams mainly and the Indian Derby that will begin shortly the Mumbai movers facing the Delhi Dynamites yeah and I pulled up the standings as you were discussing this is before this week so the Atlantic Division and Pacific Division had their matches yesterday but this is the standings just so everyone is on the same amount of matches played and as you point out Anna the Tbilisi gentlemen are just unbelievable right in, T in Tbilisi they're thrilled they're excited the battle royale was kind of their playground and Armenian Eagles the defending champions are just they're not too far behind one matchup you win a match Tbilisi loses all of a sudden you are ahead of them same with the Mumbai movers yeah, and if we look at the scores in the Eastern Division, you see the Armenia Eagles on 89 and a half, Mumbai Movers on 88 and a half. With those scores in other divisions, you could basically be the leader, yeah. but not in the Eastern Division. Absolutely. So we actually have games underway. So I pulled us back here on screen. Mm -hmm. All right, we have the Indian Derby, as you called it. And 
we see that in the first game here, Adiban, um, very mm -hmm. nice guy. He and I played in Isle of Man, and it was a very interesting game where I let him escape. So I'm still a little bitter about it. But his nickname, <laughs> if I'm not mistaken, is the Beast, right? Yes, he he is, and uh, he goes by the nickname Ad. Ad. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, Ad. I didn't know that. But what, does that stand for anything, or is just? Oh, I guess. Uh, I think it's just that a short version of Adiban. for Adiban yeah, makes... because yeah, I think it was given to Adiban by Adiban himself. Okay. Well, I, it's not a bad thing when you give yourself a nickname, but here. <laughs> in this game, he's giving himself a little bit of a hard time, in my estimation, because White has the two bishops. And, okay, I'm a little biased here. I love the bishop pair. And I love having a strong center. And White has both in this opening. Yeah. It's an interesting offbeat opening, the Chigorin, uh, in the Queen's Gambit declined. And I agree with Robert. I'm, I'm a big fan of the pair of bishops healthy pawn structure but we shall see what ad will come up with to compensate for giving up the bishop and uh, if he can create winning chances because as you know at the beginning of the matches we see board ones facing the board four of the other team so normally adiban should be winning this game there's um i'm very bad at math but i think it's almost 600 rating point difference between the two players yep, your, your math is Sorry, perfect me, spot on math yes. 600 uh, maybe it's about a bit less than 600, but I'm not going to try to figure it out exactly. I hope John is not watching. <laughs> uh, Tarini is 600 rating points below Adiban, which means that this would normally be an easy game for the board one of the movers. But we have seen so many upsets in the process league that you can never call this a win, an easy win for anyone. Definitely not, because yesterday we saw huge upsets with Grant Shu for the New York Marshals drawing both Fabiano Caruana and was he so and actually i'm looking mm -hmm. up tarini goyal's rating she's gained 70 points and she was born in 2001 so she's still a teenager which means maybe mm -hmm. she's still growing as a player as well so no, can't take anything for granted here but anna i'm going to take us over to the vive Hav suri game because mm -hmm. it has a french like element and i'm saying that in, oh. in a good complimentary way for a change because yay finally <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was a Karakan though, so as we discussed with Alex yesterday, the Karakan is basically the brother the brother of the French defense. Is it an improved version? The, the bishop is out, so there's no problem with the bad bishop on c8. Uh, well, we could discuss the pros and cons of playing the Karakan. But it was an interesting line where basically White gets the G and H pawns right out from the opening, but uh, at the same time, uh, Black has this really well placed queen in the middle of the board, castles queen side, and I'm curious to see how this game will develop. What do you think of this exact position, Robert? The current position. Yep. One second. I'm just trying to work on something a little technical here. Sure, sure. Um, I can then uh, discuss how I see it because I'm I'm really a fan of centralized pieces, so I'm biased about the queen on d5 and the knight coming to f5, attacking the d4 pawn. I like this position for black. There's no bad bishop. There are no bishops at all for black. Um, and rook takes g2. Yeah, that that was a, a critical move. It's a question what happens now after queen f6 with the knight and the f7 pawn hanging at the same time. Yes, that's a good point. And the rook on g2 looks menacing, right? I, you would think that if you're black, you can play with like queen to c4 and just ignore your knight or pawn, but you're not actually getting a checkmate, right? The bishop on c1 is perfectly located protecting this pawn on b2, so you can't actually deliver a knockout blow just yet. So if that's the case, then white's attack might come first, although at the same time, if black just plays a move like knight f5, giving up the f7 pawn, can you then go after the, the queen side and say, you're up a pawn, but the material is not as important as the attack? Hmm. Yeah, just a second, I, I realized, um, I, I don't know if my microphone is uh, higher than your one. Um, Robert, I'm just trying to figure out if we are good in terms of the audio. It might be me just shouting, guys. Remember, I'll join you. I I'm getting, been... I'm getting excited now. I'm gonna be louder <laughs> because you know what? I need to match your energy. You're a very energetic and awesome commentator, and I know I said it's early for me, but Anna, I'm with you. We're a team. <laughs> I'll try to lower my voice, but yeah, guys, I, I've been living in Spain for eight years, so. Uh, 
Okay, no, they, they're saying that it's the volume of my microphone, not that I'm shouting. It's not your fault you have a better microphone. Can, That's, it's not your I, fault. I don't know if we can fix that. Um, yeah, I'm trying to figure that out right now. So everybody stay patient. We'll cover the chess. We'll, we're going behind the scenes, or really, well, actually you're listening to us talk about it, so it's not really that behind the scenes. Yeah. But Maybe I can do something about it. Let me check if I can change my volume. I don't know. I, thought you, I, I enjoyed hearing you in this song. <laughs> I thought it was perfect. But everyone's saying it's fine. Yeah? Yeah. Um, I don't know if I can. Wait, I think I, I have a way to change it. I don't know. They're just distracting um, us. Let me know if it's better now. I think I Oh, I've now you sound something. so much quieter to me. Really? Yeah, but it's still, I can still hear you perfectly. Let's just see what the chat but I'm going to speak normal volume. So now I'm speaking on my normal volume. And I have changed the microphone setting. So guys, let me know if it's better. Of course, we will try to do our best so that no one has any complaints. Of course, we will be focusing on the chess and not the technical part of the stream. Yeah, no, we'll, we'll, we'll get to the chess. I and mean, there's a lot of chess to be played, but was better before. Anna, you're way uh, too quiet, they're saying. I, I okay, and I think there's a middle ground between. So I have one more setting type that is in between. Honestly, I like your initial setting. I thought you sounded perfect, but you know, we're, we're letting the chat get to us. Yeah, how about it now? I, and uh, this I, is the last time I'm asking because we should be focusing on the chess. <laughs> so let me know if this is good. It's okay. This is, you know what, Anna, the chess waits for us because when we're trying to figure everything out, they're like, oh, we won't make the games too exciting just yet. But then when the volume is <laughs> perfect, all of a sudden it's going to be exciting and sacrifices are going to happen. In fact, I'm looking over at some of the games here. Look at this game between Hari Krishna and Harshit Raja, right? They're in a symmetrical pawn structure where Hari Krishna is mm -hmm. equalized with no problem. Nothing's going on. So that's not that interesting. Let's look at the game. Yeah, it looks like such a boring position. Yeah, I, I'm already changing off it. Let's go to the game. Between. It could have been an exchange French. It could have been uh, a Petrov. Uh, it's a Berlin. There's so many ways to get this really symmetrical position. Let's switch. Yeah, I put on the game between Raunek Sadwani and Abhijit Gupta because that one at least... Wow. Yeah, so the, the D6 pawn is weak. Maybe white can play F6 at some moment and try to checkmate black, but... At the end of the day, I think that black is pretty solid with me like rook e5, protecting, simultaneously protecting the d-pawn, right? That's clearly under attack. But if you play a move like rook e5, you block the queen's access to d6, and you put pressure on the f5, and behind it, the g5 pawn. Yes. Um, what shall black do right now to prevent the rook takes d6 or queen takes d6? Queen takes, uh, after the capture. No, wait a second. No. Uh, he can't even, he's not threatening with it immediately because of the bishop on f3 and the bishop takes c6 queen takes c6 the rook on h1 is hanging right but rook hd1 putting extra pressure on the d6 pawn is a possibility yeah it's, it's i think though the question really is whose pawns are weaker right this pawn on d6 yeah, or totally. when rook e5 happens it's all of a sudden black gonna turn it around a4 what is that ignoring all of the weak pawns okay you can't take on d6 totally. right now right if you take on d6 rook takes six bishop f3 your queen can't take the bishop and protect your rook on d6 so that would be a terrible move yes but what white can do is to bring the other rook to d1 and then the pawn is hanging the question is is it rook hd1 or shall he take and rook hd1 what is more precise the b4 pawn will be in the air too as well as the d6 pawn so i I'm wondering if this a4, is like it could be a very strong move if black gets through with his attack, but it can also be a mistake if after rook hd1, he will have no way of protecting the d6 and the b4 pawns, like one of them should drop. Yeah, I guess the c2 pawn though is something that is also being spied on, so maybe Gupta is hoping that if you trade mm -hmm. on c6, eventually black will play for b3. So like, if we take on c6, play rook h to d1 to keep everything defended, I know I'm gonna lose a pawn over there on the queen side, so maybe mm. I can try something like b3 or rook to e4, but then you have to think about yeah. the d6 pawn, checkmates on the back rank. Yeah, I'm not in love with this decision to play a4. I think it's one of those moves you make when you're the higher rated player and you're still just yes. in I'm gonna win mode, but I think it's very risky in a moment like this. 
It is, and Ronak Sadvani is a, a very dangerous player. If you guys follow the Isle of Man tournament, Ronak Sadvani, 13-year-old Ronak Sadvani, almost beat Vichy Anand in the first round. Yeah. He went all in. He sacrificed pawns against the former world champion, and he had a winning attack where he missed in his calculation a detail, and that led to his loss in the game. But he played in a very brave way against probably his childhood idol and he is still of course a kid but imagine you grow up being inspired by Rishi and then you face him in the game and you are crushing him like Ronak Sadvani is a really dangerous player and Abhijit knows it oh, for a second I thought you're talking about me you're talking about you know childhood idols course, chess players that, Robert, almost beating Rishi oh. with the French defense the best opening in the world oh, don't, okay I'm changing the subject immediately <laughs> But no, you're absolutely right about Sadwani. He's a young kid. He's very, very talented. And well, Gupta definitely knows it. it though for your team competition here, especially because the Dynamite are, are much higher rated on the top few boards, right? They have Hare Krishna, they have Gupta, they have Suri. And then on the flip side, Mumbai has, um, they have a bit, like they're stacked within the 2400 range, right? They have Harshit Raja, they have Sadwani, they have uh, yeah. Nubair. Nubair? How do you pronounce his name? Nubair? Uh, good question. <laughs> I'm going to go over Nubair back Shah to the game. Shaikh. Mohammed Nubair, Nubair Shah Shaikh. Yeah, but these, these players are all in the 24, 2450 range, which are very, very strong players. But you, yeah. as, as the GMs versus the IMs, you're trying to pick up as many points as you can for the Grandmasters mm -hmm. here. And it's always a question, uh, what's the best team strategy? As you guys know, the, the rating cap has to be below 2,500. That means that the four players should have a rating average that is below 2,500. And that's why you see teams where there, there can be a very strong top board or top two boards and then lower rated players. In this case, the movers, they have lower rating on board two and three to have a very strong board four. He's a 2400 on board four. But for that, it means that they cannot have a 2600 or 2500 on board two and three. Yeah. While the Delhi Dynamite, they have a totally different strategy. They have a very strong top three boards and the lower rated female player on the last board. But the female player is good for the rating cap. And of course, for the team spirit, I'm encouraging every player, every team to have more female players. But it's good for the, the rating cap too, because the female player's rating counts as if it was 100 points less than what actually it is. Yep, no, absolutely. And so, um, you know, Tarini Goyal, she's trying to land some upsets. Of course, it's really tough when you're playing players like AD, Adiban, and um, all these other 2,400 plus players. So a lot remains to be seen in this match. I see that the Armenia Eagles match is also underway. None of the games are looking, well, okay, this game between Zavin Andreasin with the black pieces and Dinara Dorjieva. This is a game between the Grandmaster Zavin Andreasin, I think needs no introduction to the pro chessing audience. He was the reason, the large reason why Armenia won the 2018 pro chess league. And here with the black pieces, he has a nice looking pawn on d3. And I see this knight on c7, it's gonna to try to work its way to the center with knight to d5. But Anna, what do you think? Is that d3 pawn going to stay alive for how, well, how much longer? Um, so far it's looking promising, but I agree with you that the main question in this position, if that pawn can stay alive, then of course black is better but it's not so easy to keep it um also i'm looking at a possibility for white to weaken black's king with h6 with this queen on d2 and the bishop on c1 a funny queen and bishop battery yeah. the bishop hasn't been developed but it is basically attacking the king side so h6 is certainly a move that comes into consideration but at the same time i think if we switch back for a moment to ronan's game because it's heating up against abijay he okay. played f6 whoa Whoa, yeah, you're a g6, took an h7, and that's instructive for everyone. Gupta played king to h8, right? Obviously, played this move. And the reason you play king h8 is because oftentimes the pawn, I think it's called an umbrella pawn, right? It's like a shield for your king. Because if you take that pawn, then the rooks and the queens can line up. But now f6 came on the board, and already you can't play what you're, if you had a pawn on h7, you might try to play the move g6, but g6 loses on the spot to queen h6, sliding into g7 with checkmate. I'm really impressed by the 13-year-old boy going for Abhijit, who is a very experienced uh, player from the Olympic team of India. 
uh, once again, just uh, no respect. I mean, no respect in a good sense. Of course, you should always respect your opponent, but not too much. So that's how Ronak almost got to beat Vichy Anand. Of course, he has a lot of respect for the former world champion. But at the same time, you cannot give too much credit to the opponent's moves and just think that just because they are higher rated and just because they are a legend, you cannot have a chance against them. Yeah, he's just going to crush Gupta. I mean, King takes h7? That's it. Wait, what about Bishop takes... I'm trying yeah, to get... Bishop... Sorry, go ahead, Anna. Uh, I was also thinking of Bishop takes, but... Uh, yeah, Bishop takes, Queen takes. The rook is hanging, so we don't have time to, for Queen takes f7 immediately, but he can just bring the rook because the only piece that is missing from white's attack is this h1 rook. He can bring it to the g5, for instance, to support the g7 pawn, and then he's threatening to capture on c6 and queen takes f7. Like There has to be something. This position has to be winning for white in yeah. a few moves. It absolutely is winning. I think bishop takes c6, queen c6, rook g1 is probably the best way forward, but mm -hmm. there are also ideas but tied to g8 equals queen, just like getting rid of this pawn because in some ways it is a shield, but if you play g8 equals queen, if I take with the rook on g8, now I take on c6, and if you take back on c6 with your queen, you lose the f7 pawn with a very important check. So it looks like you could play a move like g8 equals queen, just sacrifice the pawn, put your rook on g1 like you were saying, throw your other rook to g2, and just go directly for a checkmating attack. And on the flip side, black's attack, I'm putting that in quotes, is nothing, right? There's nothing there. Your pawn on a3, well, you could take on b2 all you want. It's not going to lead to a mate. So it looks like Sedwani should pull this one off. Yeah, it was a really impressive play by the 13-year-old, uh, not uh, being afraid of Black's attack on the queen side when Black pushed a4. Ronak simply continued with g6 on the king side, and we reached this position where I think he just needs to be precise. So he's taking his time, which is um, a good thing to do in critical moments. Spend a bit more time so that you make sure that you don't miss any important detail. He has to look after his own king as well, of course. There's pressure on the C file and on the B2 pawns. But if everything goes well, this has to be a win for the 13-year-old boy with the white pieces. Yeah, absolutely. It just looks like it sh there should be something right now, some kind of move like G8 equals queen or just rook to G1, the calm move. One of these options should just be almost lights out, but he's taking his time, like you said, which is smart. There's no need to rush. You have plenty of time left, and if you play accurately here, you won't need to worry about, can I win with two seconds on the clock? No, you'll just checkmate your opponent or just yeah. land a devastating attack. So this looks very, very good for Sadwani. I'm just looking around because a bunch of games have started across the league. Uh, this game between mm -hmm. Shant Sargisyan and mm -hmm. Zamsarin Saidapov? Saidapov? Can you pronounce this for me? It's really hard. Uh, uh, let me. Uh, oh my. Zamsaran. Saidapov? Saidapov? I would need to see the Cyrillic. That would definitely help uh, me. Yeah, in Cyrillic, if, if, if we see the, the original Cyrillic writing, I think it would be easier to pronounce. Sometimes when it's, when it's translated into Latin letters, it becomes a really weird thing. I think the Y should be like E, so it's like Saidapov, could be. Okay. But uh, not sure. I have no idea. And Let's just call him Jamsaran. Okay, Jamsaran. I like that. So, yeah. Jamsaran with the black pieces is now down two pawns and his king is in harm's way. He's 22 years old, it looks like, a Russian IM. And he's even gained rating points in the last couple of months because his live rating is 2547. So, very good player. But hmm. unfortunately for him, Sean Sargissian has been lights out all season and up two pawns weak king on e7 i think we can already switch a game here because i don't think yeah. he's gonna last very long i'm very tempted to go back to ronak's game because it's, there. i think i'm there in the final stage he played rook g1 and after rook g6 a trade queen on f8. g6 is that what you're um, gonna say yeah i felt like there could have been something more precise because now at least black has managed to trade a pair of rooks which helps the defense when there are less pieces on the board I guess he wants to go queen f8 though, right? It could be. But if you go queen That's f8, very... then maybe black plays queen c4 as a response, just to cover the rook, make sure you're protecting the yeah. promotion square. But then b3, just what a, a nice looking move, b3. And just saying, I'm going to attack your queen, and where's your queen going to go to protect your rook to stop g8 equals queen? Maybe queen e6, but things are not looking ideal for black here. But maybe there's something better. Hmm. 
yeah. there's Queen of Fate. Queen of Fate is in, indeed on the board. It's a really beautiful move, but it's not winning on the spot because of the move that Robert has mentioned, Queen C4, to prevent G8 promotion. And also, wait a second, doesn't he have Queen takes G7 because he's threatening mate on B2? Oh! That, uh, <laughs> that's, it's so funny. You don't think of Queen G7 because the rook is hanging, but you're right. Queen G7, if I take yes. the rook, then I get checkmated um, first on the B2 square. <laughs> so Queen G7 looks like a good option. I guess trading the queens and rook takes D6, but then we're in the end game that probably will just peter out into a draw because I just put, put my rook on the open file on E8 and gain active counterplay. Wow, Queen you G7. Might, and this is a miss by Ronak. Um, it's still, of course, a position that he can play and try to get something out of it, but it felt like White should have been having a mating attack against the king on h7 with his g7 pawn, all the open files on the king's side, and now it's petering out into a rook end game. I honestly, queen takes g7 didn't even cross my mind because the rook was just hanging on c8. But you're so right, Anna, that queen takes g7 picks up a pawn, forces the queens off the board, and that should just be pretty close to a draw territory, I think. Yeah, Abjet has found it, of course. I was just looking at the B2 square earlier on. So if you have, if you store this tactical element in your head that on B2 there could be a mate, so the back rank I was looking at and the B2 pawn. But um, yeah, now this is just a rook and game. Rook takes D6 um, is a pawn up for wide, but um, I'm not convinced about this anymore. It looks so promising earlier on for the 13 year old. Yeah, this is, I mean, okay, even a draw is still a pretty good result, all things considered, but you're right that it's just how the game was going. It looked like he should just land some kind of finishing touch, and unfortunately for him, it seems that Gupta is escaping. So what else is going on in this match? Because I think all games are still remaining here. The game between uh, Mohamed Shaikh and Suri Vibe, Vibe Hop is also interesting, where White has kind of flipped the script here and has an attack on the seventh rank and is up a lot of time. But then again, the d4 pawn is about to fall. The c2 pawn still looks weak. I cannot tell who's better here. I think black, but I'm not mm. positive about it. Yeah, this is the kind of position that is so complex and it's going to depend on one tempo if it's really good for white or is it good for black, depending on uh, can you put more pressure on the c2 pawn right now? Can you take on d4 or will there be something on the seventh rank for white with queen f7? It's a very concrete position. That's why intuition cannot tell Robert and me whether it's good for white or black. Which means it's probably just equal. <laughs> yeah, maybe just zero, zero. Yes. Thank you guys, by the way, for writing in Cyrillic the name of Jam Saran. Thanks, Max, and everyone else who wrote it in Cyrillic. And yes, it's an English only, but we did ask for the name. So apologies to our moderators who may not have realized that it was our request to have the name written in Cyrillic. Jam Saran Sidipov, I think, but I would need to know which letter is the accent. But anyway, we're going to just keep it to Jam Saran. That's an easier yes. version of his name. Absolutely. So, ooh, queens are off in this game with Suri Vibhav, which, okay, white, it's not easy for black to regain this pawn, I guess, because now, now you take on c5, I take with the d pawn, my pawn structure looks bad, but I am up a pawn, and my bishop, right, that's a like queen c5, d c5, if my bishop can go bishop b2, bishop a5, bishop b6, right, then I'm all of a sudden, I might even checkmate this black king. So, mm -hmm. I'm actually starting to like white's chances here, the rook g2 was a very good move, stopping bishop to d2. Yes, important, important move. But I agree with Robert that this now looks better for white. We like to have an extra pawn. <laughs> Who wouldn't like to have an extra pawn? But the, the black pieces are very active, so that gives some compensation for the material. Let's switch to uh, the um, board one versus board four in this matchup, that is Adiban, AD versus Tarini, Goyal. It's an important game for the movers where they should be winning the 600 rating points different, but I am not that convinced about Adiban's attack. Although he has just played bishop takes a4. Yeah. Whoa. If queen takes, he wants to take the bishop on e4. Yep. And then he tried to mate on the, the light squares, right? Or, you know, play, yeah, somehow get this queen to h3. Four. Indeed, that f3 pawn does allow lots of tactical elements with the queen getting to h3. It would be made on g2, so she plays queen b1. She has no time. Look at her clock. 16 seconds left. Oh. 
Yeah, she has played very well, I think, up until this moment. I liked White's position, but now Adiban is really showing his beast mode, and I think it's going to be a mating attack soon. Also, he's so much up on the clock, which helps a lot, especially in such a complex position where you need to calculate. You cannot have 16 seconds on the clock. Well, yeah, queen d7. He's going right for the h3 square. It's already yeah. king h1. Just play it and hope that you can survive. What? Oh, that's actually kind of smart, right? So queen h3, she'll take on f3 and say the a4 bishop is hanging. So maybe bishop takes c5 was a really good move here. Mm. I would try knight, knight h4 maybe. But if knight h4, then king h1, right? The king can always go to h1 followed by rook to g1 covering the g2 square. That is true. This is not so simple. As Robert said, if queen h3, white will just take on f3 and then take the bishop and, on a4. And what about rook takes e4? Oh, you can't go rook e4. I'm just going to show that really quickly. Rook e4, queen e4, queen huh? h3, queen e6 check. Would have come in. Very pretty, yeah. yes. Exchanging queens in the right moment. So what shall be the move for Edibon? He played... Has he king h1. Already? Oh, she can't go king h1 because then she would get mated. So bishop f5. Now this looks like it's... Rook h5 here, and then she's going to go queen. Knight e5 was really annoying here. If white had taken the rook, queen b5. Queen... Play queen b5, only move. Oh, she lost in time. Oh. <laughs> but queen b5 was the only move here just to try to save the game because you're tr mm -hmm. but it still doesn't even work, honestly. It's just, you're getting checkmated on, on the, over here on the king side. So isn't... Yeah, that must be something concrete for black. Wow, what a game by AD. Yeah. Very well played. Brutal attack with the F3 pawn winning the game. Uh, so that is 1-0 for the movers. And the board for of the movers uh, made a draw against board one of the Dynamites, which is a really good result. Harshit Raja holding one of the top players of India, Pentala Hare Krishna. Yep. And he just played a, a very, we looked at the line earlier, we said it could be exchange French, and it looked very dry, and well, it's a very smart yeah. strategy for Harshit Raja because very solid player, 2,400 plus, not, no walk in the park for any GM, right? Just really good competition. And what is going on with Suri Vaibhav against Mohammed Shaikh? Because Rook to E4 just landed on the board, and now all the queenside pawns are collapsing. It looks like it's a move that White might have missed, pushing A4, stepping into this fourth rank attack. Yeah, this is a, looks like a problem now, because I understand the idea was to go bishop d8, bishop b6, and put the rook on h8. So that's why I actually took on a5, because now bishop d8 is going to come on the board. Mm -hmm. And But the, the thing, the huge difference now is the black king can go from a6 to b5 and get out of harm's way. Yeah. So this looks like black has seen the worst, so now I'd play rook to h8 or something like that, hoping that the rook moves from e4 so I can play c4. Because if I can put my pawn on c4, I'm going mm. to be able to checkmate you. But without being able to do so... Beautiful element, yes. It could still um, be a mating net. I love it, the idea of pushing c4. But black is smart. He keeps the rook on e4 to prevent c4 and then goes king a6 to escape with king b5 before the pawn can be pushed to c4. Yep. Oh, someone says Raunak is winning. So let's go. Oh! Is he? Look at this. Raunak, someone just got a queen. Queen, queen and he's going to take the rook. He can take the rook. Oh, rook g4. Oh, well, he's not taking it, but it's a pin. And then yeah, it, is, it, it has to be a winning position. Queen coming closer with checks. So queen e5 to pin the pawn. Yeah. Well, this is very difficult, especially with no time on the clock. Yeah, it's technically it's a difficult position. He's repeating moves. Ronak, you gotta try to win this. Ronak, try <laughs> no, he's repeating. Oh, uh, with you know, with ten seconds I understand because if you know things go south, you might even lose the game with his pawn so close yeah. to promotion. But what happened? So it looks like he went C five. Oh with check, look at that. Move forty nine was king h five yeah. by black, rook b four played, saying your king's not going to h four, your rook has no moves to keep continuing to cover the d6 square. And if your king has to go back to g6, white is the one making progress. So instead of king h4, allowing that pawn to move forward, and he went rook a4, and then that sacrifice happened. Maybe rook a4 was not necessary, I, I would have to calculate, but mm -hmm. wow, that's a crazy finish for Gupta and Sadwani. So two games by the uh, movers with the white pieces, with draws against high-rated players thus far. Yeah, it's a very good result, and they both had 
chances uh, Ronak must have had a winning position earlier. Yeah, for sure. No, I agree with you. And C4 was just played in this Vipov game, but it's a bad situation for him. Oh, but now, so is it going to be a draw? If Rook takes E6, maybe Knight takes B6, and the King goes from A5 into B4. So they went Rook King C2 first. But Rook, watch out, because Rook E8 is threatening mate. Right, so rookie. Yeah, it's still a mate. Ah, that. but look so at that. Rookie had to take on b6 first, and you're losing either your c pawn or your a pawn, or maybe both. Very smart. Rook h5, preparing knight b6. Yeah, so it might be time just to uh, try to make a draw play, move like king b3, and say, okay, I'll go down a pawn in the rook end game. But even still, it's going to be an easy thing to hold, right? Because two on one on the same side of the board should be a straightforward draw. But all of a sudden, Mohammed Sheikh with the black pieces. He's shaking and baking and trying to win this game. <laughs> I mean, just this game has been <laughs> this game's pretty been pretty wild. It looked like white was better, then it looked like black is better. All right, now it looks like white has the so bishop d6 here. Like I would play bishop d6 and try to play rook e7. Yeah, the game is still going on, so black still has to be careful. But uh -oh. he takes the a5 pawn. Rook e7, and then you oh and it, yes, it, and then this b7 Where... pawn. Where is that knight going? And the b7 pawn drops, then the c6 pawn is the new target. Uh -oh. So if, if I can get the c6 pawn, it's, there's still winning chances. And not many pieces left on the board. So if the pawn is happy, that is of course a draw. That's why uh, white has to be very careful. And now I think This looks black... bad. Ooh. That king went up the board I... real fast. Yeah, I thought he was doing well cutting the king, but then he managed to give a few checks to activate white's king. king he wants the c4 pawn. There it is. Yeah. White is going to take the c6 pawn with the king. It's such an active king. The black king is cut on the b5. This is still a very dangerous position. Oh. He manages to trade rooks, but... Um, Wait, no. He just walked yeah. right into a draw. King, okay. king b5, knight yeah. a5 check. Especially bishop f4. And he can't defend the pawn with bishop e3. If, if he plays bishop to d6... Knight a5 check, put the knight in c6, and then you're not going to be able to cut yeah. my knight forever. But if we just Permanent go back... Blockade and the draw was agreed. If he had gone bishop c7 check, king b5, and then c6 there, I guess there's still king c5 barely holding on because, you know, your knight does no way to attack this pawn c6, so you just play king c5 and wait for this bishop to either move this way, in which case you'll get a check on d6, and if it moves the other way, you'll get a check on a5. So it looks like mm -hmm. barely, barely holding on. That was a very risky play by... Muhammad Sheikh, but he held the balance in the end. So was it, no, one win for Adiban and then three draws in the rest of the games. Hmm. Yeah. This has been a very exciting start between the two Indian teams and the movers doing very well on their lower boards. That means that the Dynamite should try to come back in the coming rounds. Uh, you guys know that everyone plays everyone in the Proches League. So this was only the first round in this match. We will see three more. Everyone on the team of the movers, all four players will play all four from the Dynamite. Yep. And I have, um, just because that match is over for the first round, right? It's two and a half, one and a half movers. I just moved over to the game between Anna Sargisyan with the white pieces and Sanan Shugirov with the black pieces. And Shugirov's up two pawns. But Anna, when you see a position like this with those pawns on the king side, f6, e5, g5, h6, you're worried, mm -hmm. what if that white queen snakes its way to g6, right? If you could put this queen on g6, you're like, okay, immediately it's probably a draw. Now, that's a very long story, how to get there, but that is the thing I worry about is if the position starts opening up, black's king doesn't feel particularly safe either. Yeah, and I love this move, d6. I think Anna Sergeyan is a very talented attacking player. She finds this tactical element that if the pawn is taken twice on d6, uh, finally, her queen can get into the game with queen c8 check. That would be a disaster for black. So I, I'm wondering what shall be the follow-up here yeah. after d6. d6 is a very good move. It's opening up the lines, as you're saying. And if you don't take twice, then white just has a passed pawn. So mm -hmm. can you take one to play rook c2? You know, just like try to trade, put the rook on c2, attack the queen, cover the c file. But then queen d1 happens. And now the rook's pinned on c2 and queen d5 check. So it's very, getting very complicated here. It is. And board four of the Armenia Eagles, Anna Sergisian has been doing very well in the Pro Chess League. Uh, a new player on the Eagles team. And 
she is really impressing me every single week. This time too, she's facing the top board of the wizards and she's just going for it with D6, fearless, completely fearless. Yes, and might turn the tables completely because it looked for a while there like black was doing very well, up some material, but this D6 move, that's sometimes all you need is just breaking open the position. Instead of just slowly getting ground down where you're down some material, you play for the open position, the tactics, and it could end in her favor. I mean, so queen d7, queen c4 check, uh, excuse me? Queen f7? No, so she, he went queen back to oh, d7. Oh, once and then queen d7. But queen c4 check looks very annoying. Yeah, queen c4, black has to play queen f7 to protect the rook on a2. Oh, she went queen, queen c7. c7 is, uh, also interesting to create a c pass point if queen takes c7, d takes c7, that's almost a queen. That's a big problem. And if you take on d6 with the queen, the queen c4 check now wins the rook on a2. Yeah, you don't normally see someone wanting to go for an end game when she's two pawns down. Yep. But in this case, the c pass pawn would be so strong and white is about to take the b7 pawn. That's the reason why she's actually wanting to trade queens. Yeah, but the quality of the pawns, often more important than the quantity of the pawns. Mm -hmm. Right, just how past that pawn will be. So I don't really see how... Okay, maybe queen g4 for, oh, there's a, my neighbor's dog. I don't know if you could hear that, but. I, <laughs> I did hear it. Yeah, What's his name? I have no idea, but that dog sometimes just barks <laughs> for like just 30 minutes straight, and it's it pretty <laughs> frustrating. Whoa, what is this? So he went for some kind of passive setup, but. Yeah, now it's only one pawn up for black, and his pieces are very passive. And I think actually white missed a win. Rook d1 instead of rook takes b7. Felt like it was closing in on victory, but maybe I'm oh, mistaken. Oh, yeah. To play rook d8, next move and bishop c5. Yeah. It was very dangerous. But instead, she took on b7. And after rook c8, this position, I can't I can't think of this as better for black, even though he's a pawn up. Because black species are very passive. And also, the pawn structure on the king side how will black ever create a pass pawn? Yeah. I was thinking whether I should push g4 just to fix everything on the king's side. Well, Anna, in fact, if it's white's move here, bishop c5 would be winning. But now it doesn't work, of course. But bishop c5 was yeah. a big threat. So that's why king of seven. That's why she played king of one. Yeah, she's really good at tactics. I have, I have been looking at her games closely and tactical elements does not escape Anna. So she was searching for this motive with bishop c5 and then rook b8. King f7 prevents it, and now g4. Yeah, fixing the king side pawn structure. But I think she's doing very well saving this. That now the c7 pawn is attacked, so she will have to protect it with bishop b6. But now the king comes, right? King e6, king d7. Yeah. Maybe I was too optimistic about white's chances. And yeah, of course I'm biased. If someone's name is Anna, how could I not be biased? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, she's now this is a problem. I think she missed some opportunities with rook to d1, and that you know, I can just go back very quickly here. Instead, of, rook takes b7 is the obvious move because you're taking a pawn, but rook to d7 actually, I'll show it after the game just because there's not that much time left. But that was, I think, a very instructive moment of why rook d1 would have been such a nice move. But for now, hmm. king to d7, bishop takes c7 coming next. This looks problematic to say the least. Yeah, as uh, Sugiro managed to bring in his king he's gonna capture the c7 pawn and Ooh. then once again black has winning chances still a very good fight by anna sargissian on another board in the same match between the eagles and the wizards sean sargissian has won yet another game beating jamsaran Tsidipov of the wizards yeah and that is a minor upset because Shant is somewhat lower rated. The two players are very close in rating, but Shant has been performing very well for the Eagles, so we are not surprised by his victory. Yep, no, not at all. He's been playing so well all season here. And, well, Shigirov, rookie three check, pick up the E4 pawn, that should be. Uh, so is, is their brother and sister, right, Shant and Anna? Yes. Yeah, so the brother wins. The sister, unfortunately, had a very tough task playing against Shigirov, so no... You know, not the worst result in the world, losing to a world-class grandmaster, but um, she had her chances in this game, which, when it's over, I guess we'll try to show. But are there any other games this one comes to its conclusion that are worth diving right into? Um, I was looking at your good friend, uh, Nika. Nika Volkov? Yes. Uh-oh, is he blundering in a rook and bishop versus rook endgame? 
No, no, he's playing a rookie game against Dmitry Andraikin. Not an easy task, but so far he's holding his own. He's a pawn down, but he's about to capture the a5 pawn, so he may be achieving a draw. Nika Volkov uh, is the best friend of Robert, if you guys don't know. Yeah, looks like he's closing on draw, but I have to go back to the Sargissian game because there's no time. Yeah, sure. And look at the end game that we have here. I just said rook and bishop, Nika Volkov. Look what's going on here, Anna. Oh, rook and bishop versus rook. Yes, and Shigirov has no time. But I think it's much easier to win a position like this in, with no time than it is to make a draw because your king often gets in harm's way very... Wow, that is a risky-looking move, putting your king in a discovery Yeah. Trail. Just to be as instructive as we can be with Robert, this is a theoretical draw, rook and bishop versus rook. But in practice, it has been won and lost, depending on from which side you look at, by very strong players. So it is not that simple in practice to come up with the right defense. Right, and it's very easy to make progress. Look at what Shigirov's done. King move, bishop block a check. Then you cut the file, rook f1 now, right? It's very easy to start cutting the king. And it's very difficult if you're the side without the bishop to realize what's the exact correct setup. You know the second rank, your bishop before. Rook g1's coming next, king's pushed the h file already. This is getting in very close territory to losing if you don't know the correct yeah. defensive plan. Indeed, when the king is cut already, so when the white king, king has to go to the rim of the board, uh -oh, this king is... Oh, king of seven. Okay, or this. And bishop e5 is coming next. Is it is losing already? I think... But rook g7 this is check. Already, already either winning for black or being very close to be the winning position. It's losing. When the king is cut and all that black needs to do is to find the right setup. It's... Usually you close in, you, you prevent the check with the bishop covering the king, and then the rook swings it's... to the other side bishop of the board. F bishop f6 and mate. Bishop f6, and it's curtains because black is threatening rook h1, and you can't escape from it with the king move. It's now mate on h8. Yep, game over. No, this was a... I know Sergei has played very well, but this is a tough end game to defend with no time on the clock. Yeah, it's, it's almost impossible, honestly. It's just so difficult. Yeah. You needed that second rank defense, which he seems yeah. to have at the end, but she's getting checkmated too quickly. So, yeah, just to go back real quickly in that rook takes b7 moment, I was saying rook to d1. And the point is that now, after my rook comes to d7, I've cut your bishop off from f8 to attack the c7 pawn, and my threat is at some point to play for bishop c5 as well. Just... Maybe there's some bishop e7 blocking it, but even still, I could just throw my rook down to the d8 square where the bishop on b6 will protect it. So um, just a missed opportunity for Sargissian, a very nice ending there for Shigira. But Volkov is down two pawns now, and is he going to lose this or somehow still? No, he has to lose this, right? Yeah, earlier it was equal material, but now with the H pawn, H pass pawn being so far from the White King, this has to be a winning rook end game for Dimitri and Draki. In the top board of the Stormbreakers versus the board four player of the Tbilisi Gentlemen, who are the only team who have scored more than 100 points in the first four weeks of the Protest League. So amazing start by the Georgians. And Nika Volkov, he's only 2100 in classical rating, but his oh, he blitz rate... Rook. Oh, he's under the rook. <laughs> as soon as you were going to say that. But I was going to praise him. His blitz rating is 2,500, so he's a very dangerous blitz player. But this game was won by Andraikin in a very nice style. Yeah, that is, that is a, a really brutal way to finish that game. But, yeah, he's a very talented blitz player, of course. So respect to him, for sure. All right. So now we have... That is 1.4, the Stormbringers, uh, on the other boards between the gentleman and the... Russian team, uh, Badr Jawawa, the top board of the Tbilisi Gentleman, won. And I'm looking at the other two boards. Okay. Um, Frolyanov from the Stormbringers lost to Luka Paichadze, so that's another point for the Tbilisi Gentleman. I picked, and... I picked Paichadze on my fantasy team. Go me. Oh, good job, so far. One out of one. <laughs> I was going, I'm doing so badly in fantasy chess. Greg, if you are listening, um, I'm going to win the donuts next week. Really, I, yeah. I, I got I to gotta do better than this. Nika Volkov has lost this. We have seen I'm looking at where's the third board. I'm trying to find between the gentleman and uh, the storm bringers. I'm missing one of the players. Uh, let's see. Well, Lexi Sexy won very quickly. Yes. Just totally yes, demolished Jibaba. his opponent. Uh, Bryakin and that's it. It's, it's Schwartzman LP versus Bryak Mikhail Bryakin. Um, They're still playing. 
Oh, they're still playing. Yeah. That's why I didn't see the results. Let me catch up with that game. Yeah, I just pulled it up on the, on the board here. Black has queen and seven pawns. White has queen, bishop, and five. So it looks like Briakin should be taking care of business mm -hmm. against Pantulaya. But when I see the setup, right, this pawn on h4 for black, I see if my queen can get to the dark squares, the white queen can't venture too far away because there'll be perpetual checks. So not that easy of a position. You know, bishop d5 here, improving your bishop. But if I go queen e5 as black and trade queens, is black actually lost here, or am I going to have a defensive setup? But that's why Briakin does not trade the queens. But Anna, where's that queen going? You can't go to h5 because then queen e1, queen g3 is a draw by perpetual check. Yes, it's not such an easy position to convert, even though white has a piece up and black pawns are not pass pawns. You usually think that uh, you can only compensate with pawns for a piece if you get to have pass pawns. But as Robert pointed out, there are motifs with perpetual check all the time with queen e1, queen g3, so white has to be extremely careful. Yep. I'm not actually convinced that this should be winning because king e no don't go king e5 and queen e5 check but queen e5 is a very nice defensive setup maybe play king g1 play king f1 here's the start of that plan and get your king closer to the center so that's a yeah. good start so queen e5 shout out to approaches league commissioner Greg Shahari, who is here with us in the chat pointing out something that is i believe a fact by now <laughs> that every player around the league prays each week that anna doesn't pick them for her fantasy team wow oh wow well. <laughs> wow greg you respect my co-commentator you do not <laughs> as much as i respect greg you mean yeah exactly that you know so it's i guess zero is a hard number to be less than but yeah, this, this position here, queen, oh. So can't take on b3, you lose d6, and d6 is a very important pawn. Mm -hmm. How do you win this? Like, there's so many checks. Yeah, it's not simple at all. It should be, it should be an advantage for white, but it doesn't look at all easy yeah. to convert it. So white will be trying, of course. But 19 seconds left for Mihaly Bryakin, and there are... As Robert said earlier, so many checks on the dark squares with the queen. Now, uh, simply black and keep the queen on the on the back rank. Let's say queen a one. And uh, what is the way for white to progress? He always has to look after the d four square. The e oh, once again, he's offering the queen trade. Take with the pawn. Um, they play e four, king e five. How does white make progress here? I don't. In fact, black yeah. might be better. E four. The king e five, then f four check, then king d four. Like a very quick. Plan here, and in fact, white is getting in very big time trouble. So even if you can hold this, you might just lose because you've no time. Yeah, perhaps queen e5 was an even better move than just keeping the queen around that I was just suggesting. Because now, how do you make progress here as white? It, it's black who is achieving something in the position by creating an e past pawn, king d4, bringing in the king, such an active piece. If someone has chances here, I would say it's black. Yeah. All the black pawns are on dark squares, so white cannot take them. So, and the question is, is king c3 enough here, right? King c3, you lose e4, but you win b3, and then after you win b3, either c4, a4 is coming down as well. And if he pushes e3 first to threaten king c3? Oh, well, actually, that's just even better. Well, e3, maybe there's bishop c2, and... Hmm. Well, actually, e3, I'll go bishop f5, king c3, bishop d7. And when you take me on b3, I'll play bishop b5 True. and just sort of sit yeah. like this for a while. That actually looks like it might be a holdable there. But king c3 right away, you're going on oh, backward. Okay. So you can... Well, basically, black is saying that if he doesn't do anything, he can be playing king d4, king e5, and it's a draw because white has no way to make progress. King d2 is a smart move. Oh, okay. Now, if king e5, king c3, at least he prevents the king coming back to d4. But f3 here? Or g4? g4? Wait, g4, hc4, f3, gf3, h3? <gasps> How are you stopping my pawn wow. from queening? That's the winning strategy. Whoa, whoa, whoa. g4, if that move works, it's going to be a candidate for no, g4 game of the week. g4 and then f3. A pawn break. There it is. Yes, he's playing it. Pantolai goes for g4. Oh, no, you can't play like this. There's no way. But now f3. F3. F3 check. So it's f3. Does that work? F3. Okay, g3 I sort of like as well. Just be maybe, maybe g3 is stronger with the same idea. F3 and then g2. But f3 now, g takes. And g2, the king still catches the pawn. Can I go f? 
No, I can't do that. I was going to go F3, G takes E3 and try to play G2, but, no. you, but you have King F1. Uh, if you can do that, then this is a genius like, endgame. But you have King Sacrificing F1. the pawn and then E3 patiently and next move G2. Yeah, I don't see a defense. King F1? How could you play that move? What? No, there's no way you can hold that. F2 for starters looks pretty good. Uh, King E3, how could that be a bad move? Take on G2. I mean, King F4 first. F2, that's also smart. It's not now the white king is stalemated, and then wait, I think he, well, now he has to move the king. Wait, so wait. king c3, but now yeah, bishop e8. Green side pawns, okay. Now it's just winning, obviously. Just take take any pawn and then push the other one. Yeah, the problem for white is that he can never activate his king because the f2 pawn ties down the king to the defense of the f1 square, so black is winning on the queen side, yeah. What a game by Pantulaya. It was basically a, a game where he was fighting for saving a draw with a piece down. He was doing very well holding the position, but then in the end game, he even got winning chances with this amazing pawn break on the king side. And Robert, Robert has called it. So Robert, well done. G4, F3. Yeah, that's a nice pawn break. I always think about that, right? If I have an extra pawn, even if I don't have this E pawn, you play for G4, H takes an F3 to get the outside pass pawn. So that would have been a really beautiful way to finish the game. And honestly, the way he won anyway was still pretty nice. But it seemed like there was more there. But mistakes from both sides. But this game is over. Yeah. What game do we go Ooh, to we're next? We're being told that Anna Sargissian's game is really exciting. And it's true. She's facing Rafael Nadal, a.k.a. Jamsar on Sudipov. And White King is on Whoa. E2. What is, what is this? <laughs> What? Okay, what's the... What, what opening was this? And it's even material? Are you kidding me? Okay, we'll have to really quickly... you got to show the opening very quickly because it went wide as early as move five. Yeah, in fact, I think um, Artak Minukian had a game somewhat similar with like his early G5 stuff, but this game is absolutely crazy. So it's a home recipe of the Armenia Eagles Bishop to go for E3. this G5, H5. Look at that move, Bishop E3 check. Distracting the, the king from the g3 pawn and what in the world is this game? Who's better? That's a good question. I think black should be better, but then again, my king is better developed for white, right? King on e2, nice piece. <laughs> Just lo it looks so good there. That's such a well-developed king that it blocks the f1 bishop. <laughs> it has to be a good position for black. I would uh, I would think that if Black can finish her development real quick, like knight d7, castle queen side, everything is fine for Black. Why White is struggling to regroup his pieces? Where do you place the king? Well, put my play, put my knight on e3. Safety? G3, Ooh. threatening bishop g4, winning the queen, and also queen e4 or queen g4, queen h5. So many threats. Right. Knight e3 is a strong defense covering the g4 square. Honestly, I mean, if black doesn't develop quickly, black might just become worse. Because let's say bishop g4 check, I'll take it. Queen takes it, but king e3, or king d3 actually is probably better. My king looks ridiculous out in the center, but black is not developed either. Ooh, bishop g6, love that move. King e1, I guess, is the response. Yeah, Socratic is saying that Tudipov is playing the Bon Clown declined. <laughs> bon Clown declined. Yeah, this this is ridiculous. This game. I think King E one though is the move here, because I, mm. you're threatening Bishop H five check. You're threatening if I move my Queen to E one, the D four pawn hangs in many variations. So King to E one opens up Queen G four. But okay, but Queen D two. I'm not feeling confident about White's position anymore. Yeah, uh, usually this is uh, not the ideal setup, having your king on e2, bishop on f1, and even if you are given two to three moves, I still don't see... Okay, maybe if white can play rook e1, king b1, king c1, castle queen side, yep. <laughs> and then move the bishop, then okay, but you don't have that much time because next move black castles queen side, all the development has been finished. Now, Castle Queen side to protect the b7 pawn. Oh. I don't think he, she should mind the e7 pawn being captured no. because that opens the e5. Yeah. With the king on e2, you can't play like that. No, you're absolutely right. And, and it's sad because even so she castled, and rook e1 was not possible with the queen on d2. So if I just show that real quick, rook e1 ran right into queen h5 check, and the king has no escape squares. Covered, covered, 
covered, and so you would have just lost in the spot if rookie one was played before queen b4. Yeah, some great quotes in the chat and comments. The king is a fighting piece. Also, my king likes to go for a walk. We love you guys, and shout out to everyone watching on Twitch and Chess TV. This is a pro chess league, week five, the Eastern Division, and we are now observing the games of the defending champions, the Armenia Eagles, facing the Moscow Wizards. Yeah, and they love themselves some Lou Reed. They're taking a walk on the wild side, right? This king on E2 yeah. is its not really a walk. It's just been stuck there for a while. So it's like, yeah, this looks very, very nice for Anna Sargissian. But as she showed last game, even, you know, it's never over till it's over, right? That you have a good position, you need to finish the game, and that's when the game is completely won or, you know, you hold a draw or whatever. Like she had rook and bishop versus rook, but when you get into time trouble in this kind of format, things certainly can go away from you. You can just lose, lose track of things. So, yeah, this game is interesting, though. Very, very interesting. Yes, and she should do something immediately. There's no time for slow moves in a position like this when the opponent's king is in the middle of the board. So knight b6 to capture on d5 is a very concrete line, and I think she's, she's uh, doing it the right way because you cannot allow white to just walk to c1, king d1, king c1. Yeah, definitely not. So queen c5 looks risky. Like, you're protecting d5. That's the good news. The bad news is your king is still on e2. Like, that king needs to go somewhere. It's going to go to d2, and maybe you're just barely in time to do this. But if I'm black, I want to play f5 and then play f4 and say, now my queen on h4 protects e7. How, f5 just looks winning. Yeah, I think that's a very strong move, joining the g3 pawn and chasing away the good defensive piece that is the e3 knight. The e3 knight has been the key in holding this position for white. Queen f4 is also logical because she's threatening queen f2, although that means that the king is going in the direction where it wants to go, d1 and c1. But now bishop h5 check. And if king to c1, then you're going to take on d5. Because once your queen, excuse me, your king enters that diagonal, as, then your knight no longer protects d5. So, Indeed. Yeah. Maybe even, so bishop h5 check, I guess bishop e2 is the desperate response, but I don't think you're going to survive much longer. Bishop h5 check, bishop e2, I take on e3. You take my bishop on h5. I move my queen anywhere, let's say to g5, and d5 is going to be lost. h5 is hanging. Mm -hmm. doesn't look very, very good here. Yeah, it looks it looks winning for Black, and this is a very impressive game by Anna Sergisian. As we mentioned, she's really good in attacking chess. So I have been I have been witnessing her games, and she she does manage to upset her opponents, especially in dynamic positions. So I'm not surprised at all that she's launching such a powerful attack. Something went wrong for White early in the opening. The king doesn't belong on the e2 square, but in this game, it happened. And Jamsaran, who is a very strong player, 2500 rated international master from uh, Moscow, he just somehow couldn't deal with this g5, h5 moves in the opening. Yeah, and they have the best logo in the league, but right now they're not giving us the best look in this match because they're 2 2, <laughs> so they're still doing fine, but, you know, Jamsaran is struggling for sure. Yeah, shout out to our usual producer, Aaron, who is here in the chat. And also to everyone just tuning in. We are almost 2,000 chess friends from all over the world watching on Twitch and on Chess TV, the action. This is the Pro Chess League Week 5 with some of the top players in the world competing for their teams. They are teams from cities. So right now you're witnessing the team from Yerevan, the Armenia Eagles versus the Moscow Wizards, these two capitals facing each other in digital space. That is the pro chess league hosted by chess.com. And that's my co-host Robert Hess, Grandmaster Robert Hess, one of the best commentators in the world that you can find. And he even shaved for you guys. I did. You know, I was fully bearded last night. I just was like, you know what? <laughs> Quick turnaround. Let me surprise the Twitchosphere. And that way, that, that's the reason why I shaved. But thank you, Anna. That was a very generous introduction. This is my co-host, Anna Rudolph, international master, commentator extraordinaire, and thank you everyone for joining us here on Twitch. But we have a lot of chess to look at, a lot of great games, and the matchups are close right now, right? Still in the early stages, and I'm going to throw up the format just so I can remind everybody, oh, that was the Battle Royale format, don't want that. Here we go. So teams from five con continents, 32 teams in total, and we have five of the top six players in the world competing. And just a reminder, look at that third bullet point. Time controls are 15 minutes with a two-second increment head-to-head matches. 
board one plays board four, then plays board three, board two. You play everybody on the team that you're playing. And that fourth and final bullet point, the final four teams will compete at the live final late spring. The dates are May 4th and 5th. Location to be announced soon, but yeah, just to remind everybody what we are here and doing. But That's it. You guys should write in your agenda May the 4th and the 5th, the finals of the Proches League, and it's going to be an epic eSport chess event where the players will be facing each other on computers. So imagine two computer screens facing each other, the players sitting in front of each other with noise cancelling headphones so you can shout and cheer, have a beer or eat a pizza right next to the players. It's an epic epic event that you got to attend because it's nothing like a usual chess event. Do you do you write that beforehand because that was a great pitch. You're like you can shout oh, and, and I'm cheer. Oh, coming up with nonsense all the time. You said shout and cheer or have a beer. You had like a nice little Dr. Seuss rhyme. You know, was... Oh, I had no idea. Uh, oh, and we got to shout out Hanju Koren, who has gifted tons of subscriptions Whoa. to the channel of Chess.com. You guys can subscribe too to have access to all the amazing emotes. And if you click on my head, I think, just click on my face somewhere here. Yep. That's the channel of Robert and the Pro Chess League channel with Pro Chess Lessons. And also my channel is somewhere here. So move your mouse <laughs> here and then you can click on our channels. Yeah, absolutely. Well, speaking of clicking, I think we spent a lot of time with this game. It will still be interesting so we can get back here. And I'm going to take us over to the game between. It's another game in this match between Shant Sargissian and Sanan Shugirov because I see this as an end game here where black is up a pawn, but white has the two bishops. So things could be heading towards a good position for black, I think. The knights do well to protect each other, but I'm not... I say that with a huge question mark because at some point f3 is going to be a problem kicking the knight away from e4 and then my rook controls the c-file so hmm. i don't know it looks like if i play f3 and you take on g3 then i take your knight on c5 your knight has to come yeah. back to f5 then i can take on f5 and maybe put my rook on c7 something like this but rook c8 comes i don't know black should be totally fine here hmm yeah, it's it's funny when you see the pieces being so tied down in terms of the c5 knight is depending on the e4 knight, but knight takes g3 is a capture, so it's not a problem that f3 is in the air. And if white tries to move the bishop to repair f3 as a threat, uh, where do you place this bishop? I think the problem is that there isn't really a good square for the g3 bishop if bishop e5. Uh, in worst case scenario, black can attack this bishop with f6, and then you got to find another square, a new square for the bishop. There aren't too many. Bishop c7 should run into rook c8, yep. I believe. Absolutely. Fighting for that c file is very important, and the bishop on e6 covers that c8 square. So, yeah, we're going to leave Shigirov to figure out what to do. I just wanted to do a little bit of a roundabout here. Uh, we have Hike Martirosian, that's Mikatarian username, against Dinara uh, Dorjieva, and that's mm -hmm. B. S and Sun, and with the black pieces, up a pawn is Dinara Dorjieva. I like her position a lot, actually. Me too. Me too. I like, as usual, centralized queens. This queen on e5 is looking cool. Uh, the question is, what happens if queen takes e5 tripling black's pawn? So it could be a very funny pawn structure. Queen takes e5, d takes e5, but white is not interested in that. Yeah. Um, normally, I would say it's a very weak pawn structure, but in this case, it was forcing the knight away from d4. Now she plays queen f6, tripling uh, the heavy pieces on the f5. It's a semi-open five for black and preparing to push in the center with d5. Yeah, and that's a very important pawn push because the bishop on f5 is kind of trapped. So g4 is a threat, but if g4 can be met by e5, then you're just retreating the knight now and playing. No, this is just great for black. Up a pawn, play bishop d7, put that bishop on c6, and then play for e4. You know, just kind of break open the position with ease. That oh, looks very, very nice here. The knight is coming toward the d5 square, which is very logical, but bishop e6 prevents the jump. I mean, white can still play knight d5, but it's going to be captured right. by the bishop. But it's just a pawn up, so you know that's you have two yeah. e pawns, <laughs> two very nice e pawns. Yeah. Queen f4 was just played, makes perfect sense. You're up a pawn, try to trade the queens. Okay, white still has chances to hold in a position in an end game like this, but definitely no more than that. A5, rook c8 to c5 is one of the first things that comes to mind. G5, g4, actually, that's probably much better. Just play g5, 
these two rooks in the F file, but they're staring into a brick wall with this pawn on F3, mm -hmm. protected by the pawn on G2. So you play G5, play G4, and then get, take control over the F file. She played rook C8. Yes, I like your idea with G5, G4. Rook C8 also makes sense because this knight on C3 was a loose piece, and and at some point, if you could open the C5, that would be great. Knight A4, heading toward the B6 square, but I don't think that this is uh, much for white. Uh, the A5 pawn will be in the air after knight B6, rook C. Five. Okay, knight b6, rook c5. Maybe he can try. No, with b4, then the c4 pawn will be loose forever. Yeah. yeah, I'm not I'm not a fan of this maneuver, knight a4, knight b6. It's just going into thin air. There's nothing to attack from b6. Normally, it would be a nice post for the knight, but in this position, it, there's no target that the knight can attack from b6. Right. And the bishop on e6 is perfectly placed covering the d5 square. She needs to play g5, g4. Like, she should have done this with the double rooks in the F file and the king on H1. I agree. She could still do it, but it's not mm -hmm. quite as powerful as it was several... Wait. Okay, my first thought is just G3 trap the rook. I guess your rook is the D4 square um, to, to rush over to. And mm -hmm. bishop C2 was a threat, which is why rook E2 was played. But I wonder why she is not pushing the G pawn. It looks like such a natural way to progress. G5, G4, as Robert mentioned. Rook D4 instead to trade a pair of rooks... Bishop c2 here. Ooh, nice, because rook takes c2, then the d1 rook is hanging. Yep. Bishop c2 Bishop is c2 very good. Bishop c2 to win the move. b3 pawn, I love it. Bishop c2, you want to, there it is, taking b3. It's on the board, Dinara has found it. Very nice play by black. Yeah. It just goes to show that, yeah, g5, g4 was a very natural plan, but also because of the queen side weaknesses, the light, the pawns of white are on light squares, and that's where... Uh, black can just simply go Pac-Man mode with the bishop, take on b3, take on c4. Uh, knight b6 has to be played to defend the c4 and, pawn. And then rook c5 will be the response to win the a5 pawn. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, this is just... I mean, you, you can play for e5 to try to win c4, but then your d6 pawn is weak. So this was a nice decision. Play king e8 here. There's no risk whatsoever. What does she think? Okay, she can go king g7. I guess it doesn't matter too much. But king e8 just feels towards the center. Everything is safe over there on the king side. So this is a very nicely played game by Dinara Dorgieva. I'm, I'm very impressed. Indeed. Indeed. And it's it's quite an upset. There's almost 300 rating point difference between the two players in a match that is tied so far 2-2 two -two between the Ar Ar Armenia Eagles and the Moscow Wizards. Very important point by Dinara. Yes, essential point. And the Armenia Eagles defending champions, doing well this year in the Pro Chess League, but if they are losing games with the white pieces while they're outrating their opponent by 280 points, then that's not yeah. a good sign. Actually, congratulations to uh, Haik Martirosyan because I know he just qualified for the Armenian Olympic team, the uh, Chess Olympia team. He played a match with Robert oh. Hovhanesyan, and he won that match mm. two and a half, one and a half in that head-to-head -head battle. So huge congratulations to the youngster from Armenia. I had the pleasure of meeting him and hanging out with him when I was in Yerevan. Um, back yeah. in October of 2018. Really, really nice person. I don't know his opponent, so I can't comment on her as a person, but as a player, she's pretty awesome. So 18-year-old. Yeah, Hike I have no idea that Hike has qualified yes. to play on the team of Armenia. It's very difficult to get into the Olympic team of Armenia. So definitely it's a huge achievement by Hike, and now he has to save this game. One thing that our commissioner has pointed out in the chat correctly is that Dinara is down on the clock. It's only one minute left for Dinara and nine minutes for Hike. So at least that is a factor that is in favor of Marty Rosian. It does raise his chances of saving half a point. Significantly. In fact, she just took on F4. I don't know why she did that. She could have just taken the pawn on A5. Like, if she just taken... F4 didn't actually threaten the pawn. It's protected, so rook takes A5 was a free pawn. Instead, she allowed this rook to capture the B7 pawn, which may not seem that important, but knight D7 to F6 is a threat at some point, going for the H7 pawn. Your A6 pawn is clearly um, not that strong a piece if you take on C4, which did not just happen. Okay, he's going for knight D7, knight F6, a checkmate. That, that is exactly what he's doing. So if black is not careful, knight D7 will be very, very painful yeah, beautiful mating now that it just goes to show that even in endgames, you got to be so careful with tactical elements, especially when you see a king on h6, got on the seventh rank and the knight could come in. A right, rook f5 seems to be a nice move. you got to move away the rook so that you can start pushing the a pass pawn. 
But what about knight c8 here? Like the knight. Good call. Good call. <laughs> yeah, knights are such Going tricky pieces. You take d6, you go rook c8, then knight e4, and that comes to g5 or to f6. Like all of a sudden, I really feel like white is um, the one who's calling the shots here. Knight c8 played. Uh oh. You got to take on c4. Knight d6, got to play rook c5. Then knight e4. This is all going to happen. There mm -hmm. it is. Play, just play rookie five. Happening. Oh, wait a second. Yeah, you gotta play rook f5 to prevent knight rookie f6. Rookie five was, a, was, oh no. But knight g5, threatening mate with rook h7. But knight g5 to case. king h5 to g4, I guess. Yeah. Okay, so. The knight goes back to d6. And if now knight e4, trying to repeat moves. Maybe rook c6, honestly. Yeah, knight just anything but rook f5. Yeah, rook f5, she might just do it because she has no time yet. She's going to make the draw. Oh, king h5 now. Oh, why is not repeating? That was a very brave decision by Haik Martiros, and he's two pawns down, and instead of repeating moves, he goes for knight g5. You call it brave. I call it a little bit silly, honestly. I think that <laughs> king h5 now. Just oh, Okay, a5 was good. King h5. Go king h5. Put that king on the square. Do it. There it is. Yeah. King h5. h4 is now hanging. Bishop d5 check. Because of the capture, f takes g3, unpause. Yep. Important to remember your en passant rule. Very, that's a very good call. No, this is actually just great for black now. Oh, here's g4. Oh, he still plays g4, but it's going to be H6. captured. Okay. <gasps> Why go back with the king? She was worried about getting checkmated, like if h6 and knight at h3 to f4 or something, but oh. no, she should have played h6 and then g5 and just broken out. Yeah, it looked logical. King g7, king h8. Ooh, okay. She's just tr trading down. Take on f7, take on a5, make a draw. Yes, it is a draw if white well, takes on f7 and then captures a pawn. Two versus one is a theoretical draw and rook end game. White is not interested in it. It's just incredible. Marty Rosian is playing with fire. He's two pawns down. He doesn't want to go for the drone variations. Yeah, he just. Oh, is this the way he wants to repeat now? No, he wants to go knight d6 and if rook f6, knight d8 check. So don't. Oh no, she blundered. <gasps> she blundered it. Oh no. Oh, Greg Shahadi's prediction came true, which is the worst thing of oh, all. No. What, what a set finish to a, a very well played game by Dinara oh. stepping into a fork. Knight e8. Guys, get out your fork emotes in the chat. Oh, Whoa. no. I mean, you had to go rook f1 at this moment, but that's a hard move to play to separate your rook and your king. So she plays the, you know, the safe looking move, rook f6. Knight e8 check, pinned bishop. The rook on f6 is hanging. That is tragic geometry for black and i knew that was coming I, I really just saw that coming from a mile away and oh i feel so bad because she played such a good game yeah it's a fork in the combination with a pin so good point guys to use both emotes on chess.com and eric also has a great emote you guys should check out eric rose's channel for the other really cool fork emote Oh, what a game. What, oh. what a painful finish to a very well played game by Dinara. She would have deserved perhaps the full point after how she played in the opening. And then it was at least a job as she stepped into the one and only tactical motive that there was. I feel really bad. So I'm switching games to the Levant Pantsulaya game because he's completely winning. That is um, Schwartzman no. LP. In fact, he just won by resignation. His last move, he went just took this pawn on d6 because that pawn d6 held black's position together and when he went rook takes d6 mm -hmm. and move 22 if you take back rook f6 queen e7 check is picking up this rook not to mention your king might just get checkmated very quickly so instead yeah. didn't take and well okay he just doubled his rooks queen e5 still hanging that's game over Wow. Yeah, and uh, those of you asking for other games that we are not covering, there are so many games going on at the same time, all these matches happening right now. If you want to check other games, do type in the chat on chess.com slash follow hashtag PCL. I don't know if we have a link to that, if Mubot or someone could write it in the chat slash follow hashtag PCL, then you can choose the game that you want to focus on. We can only pick one game at a time. Yeah, no, and we have this game between Shant Sargisyan and Sanan Shugirov, and Sargisyan with the black pieces. Well, we talked about the endgame earlier. He was up a pawn, but white had the two bishops. Now white only has one bishop. That pawn has moved down to b4, and it's looking... I don't know if it's going to be winning, because the knight on d4 is very strong. The pin on the c-file is annoying, but maybe just offer the trade of rooks. Play knight back to d6. Okay, went g4. Ooh, g4. I like that, actually. 
Try to get your knight some outposts in the e4 square. Mm -hmm. Yes, if f4 that weakens the e4 square, knight d6, knight d4 could come in the future. It's, it is a very nice way of trying to force white, give up some of the crucial squares in the center. Yep, this looks like a very nice little attempt there. Also, after the capture, the e4 square will be an outpost for Black's knight. Yep. It's back to g1. Which now I'd immediately play knight d6, offering the trade of rooks because the king is so far away. Okay, mm. he's going f5, maybe to go f4, try to create even some attacking chances. People look at endgames, they think, oh, well, it's just going to be some boring endgame, whatever. No, there are actually attacking chances, especially if I can get my knight to the f4 square. The king is not feeling so comfortable over on g1. So. Yes, f4, g takes f4, knight takes f4, threatening knight e2, fork. Yeah, and then knight d3, knight h3. Knight, knights are really annoying pieces, especially in blitz. Yeah, with one minute left for both players, this is going to be a very exciting finish. And we have witnessed already that even good players, very strong players, can make mistakes, blunders. With the knight being a tricky piece, yeah, f4 is on the board of g takes, f4, knight takes, f4, we have mentioned, knight d2 in the air, knight d3 is also a threat. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. Um, so yeah, really nice play thus far. And I've been told that the Armenia team is playing together, which is really nice. So. Oh, nice. So they are, they are playing from a physical location. Yeah, and, and I've been to the Tigran Petrosian chess um, house. It's oh, beautiful. Oh, it's such a beautiful place. Yeah. It's a chess palace named after former world champion Tigran Petrosian in Yerevan, in the center yep. of Yerevan. A lovely place. And they still have the typical wooden boards, the, the boards where people would use, like, I'm, I'm trying to explain how to, uh, how to put it when it, in the times when there was no online broadcast and you wanted to follow games that were being played, you had players who were not playing their games or like chess fans moving pieces on a wooden wall board. So imagine a wall where there's a gigantic demonstration board. Yep. And in this chess palace, they still have those really old boards on the wall. You would need to use a wooden stick to move a piece on the wall. I don't know if I explained it no. very well, but it's an... It's a place to visit if you're in Yerevan. No, it's definitely a beautiful place. They're actually playing, I was told, from the Chessify office. So they're not mm. playing at the Tigran Petrosian Chess Palace, but that place is definitely, if you're a chess fan, and even if you're not a chess fan, there's so much history there, and a lot of Armenian successful chess players have grown up and gone through. Okay, now, well, Sean Sergisian is just making work of this position. Rook B2 check. Can't go to G3 because Rook G2 check comes. This is definitely over here. The winning position for sure. Game over by resignation. Good on Sean. Yet another point for Sean Sargisian. It's another upset. He is lower rated than his opponent, but he has been performing so well that we are not surprised when he beats a stronger grandmaster, higher rated grandmaster with the black pieces. He's on fire, Sean Sargisian, one of the best players of the Eagles. Yeah, he's and he's young, he's talented, as is Anna Sargisian, whose games we were looking at before. So very strong brother-sister duo there. And in fact, Shant, yeah, still, I looked at his live rating, just looked it up, 2488, 16 years old, clearly a talented player, especially in his quicker time patrols. So, where to from here? Looks like we have, no games are in time trouble right now, so we can take a breath. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna take some water, Ooh. take a sip of my water. And give a shout out to all of you guys tuning in. Over 3,291 chess fans from all over the world watching the Project League. Thank you guys for tuning in on Twitch and on Chess TV. This is our broadcast of week five, the Eastern Division. There are four divisions. We have, the teams are divided because of their physical location so that the time zones fit. Nobody has to play in the middle of the night or way too early in the morning. Although it's early for us, Robert, isn't it early? <laughs> yeah, it's 11.24 uh, a.m. for me here in New York, but I've been woken up by the great chess and I've been having a good time commentating with you, Anna. So it's not too early, never too early to have some <laughs> Anna Rudolph in your life. That's, that's really my feeling. Never today. too early for Robert has and I'm going to use one of my favorite emotes from chess.com that is inspired by Robert has the bagel emote. You guys should be very fond of this emote because that's one of the favorite snacks of Grandmaster Robert has. And if you want to follow Robert's channel, hover the mouse over my head here, click here. There you can follow and subscribe to Robert's channel. There's also my channel and the Proches League channel for more shows, highlight shows on the Proches League and Proches League lessons. Yeah, definitely. And well, Anna, I just 
caught out of the corner of my eye, a game between my Narva, May, my, do you know her? Mm -hmm. I think my Narva. Okay, my Narva with the black piece against Nikita Afanasiev. So do you know her by any chance? Um, I think she she's uh, 22 approximately. I met her once. Oh, okay. Well, so I, you know, I know she's uh, playing on this Estonian team and she's a very good player, right? She's, oh, she's 19 years old. Wow. So she's, oh, she, I'm making her older than she is. Yeah. And I'm, I'm looking, she, she goes to UMBC. So she's in the United States right now. Oh, she's part of the chess program at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. That's good for me to know. So she's a psychology major. I'm on her page on the team's official website. She won the European. Where do, you get, where do you get all this information from? Yeah, she won the European Girls Under 16 Championship. And she's, yeah, the highest rated female player in Estonia. So, okay, well, now I have all the information I need. But she is a very good player, a very good pickup for this Estonia Pro Chess League team. Because um, when you think about lineups, right, they have a bunch of 2,500 GMs. She's a really good board four in a league like this, right? Because her rating is 2320. Um, she's young, she's improving. She's in university now, but a university that really supports chess. And I see that mm -hmm. she's played four games in the league thus far and took one and a half out of four. So she, her performance rating is above her rating in that first match. So it's clearly yeah. a good player to have. Greg Shahali has some more information on my Narva. He's saying that she is also very fond of Tetris, apparently. Wow, is she? I thought that she, Tetris, like I used to play Tetris when I was a kid. I didn't know that it's still such a big Oh thing. yeah, I'm going to send you the video of Jonas versus Joseph from the 2018 championship. It's unbelievable. You're going to love it. Like I just was mesmerized watching um, that fi finale there because it was a 16-year-old kid versus a seven-time champion. And the six, oh. I won't ruin it for you, but it was really fascinating to watch. But before I ruin it for you because I'm really want to tell you about it. The chess position that we have with uh, my Narva, <laughs> here she's even on material, but her position looks not good as her mm -hmm. king is still in the center. This pawn on e6 is not good at all, right? You, you sort of want your pawn on a7 to be on f7, and then you'd feel a lot better. Mm -hmm. So I'm hovering that pawn yeah. over there saying, please protect my king. But with this pawn all the way over there on a7, well, that pawn e6, is just a vulnerability. Queen g4, or bishop h3, or rook e1, or all of these moves are going to happen, and your position is just on the verge of collapsing. Yeah, something must have gone wrong for my in the opening, because this is only move 14, and white's position is clearly better because of all the factors that Robert has mentioned. Queen c5 is a logical move, trying to trade queens so that her king would be less vulnerable, but white can simply move the queen on, over to g4, attack the e6 pawn, attack on the king side, and I think this is going to be quite a painful position for my. I just don't even see how can she, how can she survive the next couple of moves, queen g4 with an immediate threat on e6. Yeah, this is, queen g4 is just such a move you, you play without even thinking, right? Because, yeah, you gave up your piece on e5, so you're dropping a knight, but when you take on e6, oh, then maybe knight e7. And then you protect oh. your rook, you protect your knight. That's actually something, I take it back, queen g4 was played. Yeah, I saw that he was getting back the piece, so that's why I said queen g4 so easily. But yes, Robert is right. It takes some more calculation uh -oh. because knight takes e5, queen takes e6, knight e7, defends both the rook on c8 and the knight on e5. Um, this is getting a much more complicated than I initially anticipated. Yeah. Maybe there's... I totally mis-evaluated uh, that position. No, but there's bishop e3. Like, you're, you're still... Oh, no, you're still just attacking, right? Bishop e3 is a move. And then queen yeah. c7, you bishop f4. It's looking... Ugh, tough. Still very tough. Yeah, by intuition, I would say that that position has to be winning for white yeah. because the black king is in the middle of the board. Black hasn't developed yet, but you gotta you gotta calculate that first and then sacrifice a piece. Yeah, for sure. You know, thank you, Joe Bruin, saying you like the clean shave. It was really just for mm -hmm. you Twitch fans here. That's really the only reason I did it. But yeah, I don't know. We gotta appreciate the dedication of Robert going from one broadcast to the other. He barely sleeps, he doesn't eat, he just had a shave so that he could come up hey, with a new look between the two broadcasts last night and this morning. My mom is probably watching this broadcast. At first he shout out mom and dad, oh. but also 
can't say I, yeah, no, I don't eat. Mom. My mom already worries that, you know, am I eating enough? You know, she's a mom. So, yeah. Um, yes, uh, mom, I ate. Don't worry if you're watching. Love you. Uh, we love Robert's mom. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. I don't love my Narva's position, though. So, I think, can we, or how are teammates? I'm looking at the game between Jan Elvist and Sergei mm -hmm. Savitsky. And that pawn in F6 is keeping Black's position very stuck, but Black is up a pawn. So. Hmm. Yeah, this is the typical imbalance. What is more important? Is it the material advantage of Black that will prevail, or is it that White is up in development? White has the initiative and this really annoying pawn on F6. I would say by intuition that White is doing more than fine here, because the Black King is still in the middle of the board that couldn't develop the f8 bishop and it is not going to develop it in the next moves either because it has no squares this f8 bishop such a poor piece yeah that's <laughs> that's unfortunate so you want to push this pawn from d6 to d5 right like but your knight's there and where's your knight going your knight doesn't really have any good moves to make use of either so knight c7 comes to mind to play d5 and like actually knight c7 so you go d5 bishop d6 knight e6 but even once you do that and you try to castle kingside, that queen might land on h6 and you get checkmated anyway. So hmm. here comes the ambulance. It might be for black's position here. Uh, I hear here it. Here comes the ambulance. There it goes. It's, it's quiet today, though. That means there's not too much traffic. Usually it starts kind of honking and making sure that it can get through. <laughs> but, uh. Yeah, this is a troublesome position for Sergei. Mm, I wonder if there's a way he's trying to develop of course h5 to create space for the bishop on h6 uh, of course it is white who has to prove what what does he have right. for the sacrifice pawn so white has to come up with something really concrete and fast before black finishes his development although even if you play bishop h6 Anna, right like let's say I make some random move like I don't know, pawn a5 yeah. looks like a decent move and if we trade on h6 you still can't castle and then maybe I can just hold the position down, saying that I have um, just a clamp, and you have no mm -hmm. real way to make progress. I'll play rook b2, rook b1, and take yeah. over the b file. So maybe rook f2 here. Okay, a5 was played, but rook f2 and swinging that rook to b2 might have been already an, an option for white to start trying to make progress. Yeah, I agree with you that even if black achieves that finally the bishop can be developed, it's still not an easy game because uh, of the miscoordination between the pieces, Varsha, the king go, the black king, even if you walk it to g8, then what is the rook doing on h6? Um, not a dream position. No, not at all. So bishop h6 played, just take that, I think. Hmm. Yeah, take. C4 is an option as well, just to then go queen e3. Whoa! Ruby 7? Love that move. Beautiful! If queen takes b7, it's a family fork. Knight takes d6. Yikes. Boom! So I was trying to get the rooks to double on the b file. This is by far the best way to do that because you already put Definitely. your rook in a menacing position and then your rook can swing to b1 from f1. That is, that is a great move. Sam Copeland. Sam, I did this to you last night. Whenever I want you to remember a game, I just say Sam Copeland. He goes, I'm always watching. Oh. <laughs> Sam. Shout out to Sam. Shout out to the chess.com team and also to our moderators. Your guys are doing an amazing job and we love you. Rook B7. What a move. I can't wait till Sam makes a comment in the chat. He better be watching. Otherwise, I'm just talking <laughs> to myself. Let's tag him. <laughs> Sam. He knows. He knows. If he's here, he'll, he'll make a comment about I'm it. I'm going to send him a bagel. There it is. There he is. Always listening. Oh. <laughs> so, you know, first, you're right. We've got to give a shout out to Sam Copeland. He's the guy who does so much behind the scenes. He does a lot of um, the social media. He's trying to figure out who deserves game of the week. So he's really looking at every single game. So he says he's always watching. He means it. But sometimes it's nice when I'm just there. Like, Sam, instead of him having to ask me later, in the moment, in the thick of things, we're like, look at that move, Rook to B7. So, I mean, just really a good shot. And the king on E8 can't move yet. Rook F1 to B1 coming. I wouldn't be surprised if he sacks an exchange on B6 at some point just to win the D6 mm -hmm. pawn. And look at this yeah. rook on H6. What's or it some rook takes F7 if, if it can come in the future with 9G5. 
anything can happen in this position, but rook fb1 is a very logical move to bring the f rook to the open b file and black's position. It, even though black is a pawn up, it is a nightmare to play this position. Yeah, rook. The h6 rook is basically not in the game and it's going to take forever to activate it. Plus, the king is still in trouble. Oh, no, there's an amazing tactical shot here. Rook fb1. If your knight takes c3, I go rook takes f7 check. And once you go king f7, knight g5 check, your king goes to the back rank. I take your queen, you take my queen back, and then rook b8 is a check on the back rank. The rook on h6. Puzzle rush time. Puzzle rush. The rook on Yay. h6 doesn't look very useful. I know, Sam, you're still watching. I saw you before, but Sam, just keep an eye out for knight c3, rook f7 check, and then you're like automatically game of the week, right? Just you, you don't get to play tactics like this and not win game of the week, or at least a nomination for game of the week. Everyone get your puzzle rush emotes in the chat. It could be a beautiful finish if knight takes c3. Uh, taking advantage of the pin on the long diagonal, rook takes f7. Amazing move pointed out by Robert and knight g5 coming with a back rank mate idea. You can't even stop it, right? Because like, what, what is your move here? If you're rook c7, then I just go right to the back rank with rook b8 check. If you, you don't have any other knight move, your rook on h6 has nowhere to go. So it's just like... I don't. I think it's unstoppable here. Yeah, uh, I don't know what Black can do about this. Another way to try to create some mess would be Knight B4 to cut the connection between the rooks to threaten the B7 rook. But I just don't think that Black can get away with moves like that when the position is on fire. Yeah, this is looking, this is looking real sharp and in the worst kind of way for Black because only one side is controlling how much, uh, I don't know where I was going with that. So just, just, it's great for white. I had nothing further there. Yeah, not good, not good. I think we should stick around because this is going to be an impressive finish. Although- Black has two minutes left, or maybe we can switch for a quick moment and then come back. I just saw to... that my Narva has 30 seconds left. Oh, so, okay, let's go there and then we come back with uh, Alice. But she's totally lost. And... I, th oh, I think. Oh, poor Narva. Yeah, she's now down a pawn because she lost her piece. Let's just see how that happened really quickly. Bishop e3, mm -hmm. and oh, rook d1 to d5. No development for black, and white simply picked up the material and now is up a pawn, has the two bishops. There's probably some tactic here that's winning with like bishop h3 or just rook f to e1 and controlling the entire e file. Yeah, so we can go back to the other game, but I just wanted to check because I saw she had 30 seconds. So no move yet after Elvis had rook fb1. Do you just lose on time because you're so hurt by this position? I guess he will try to come up with something, but it's such a desperate position that I can understand why Sergei is taking so long to come up with a move. It's very difficult to come up with a move, and there is no move. There's no defense. And, resigns. and he resigns. That was his decision, to resign. It's really sad when you resign a position where it's like not immediately clear to less experienced players what's going on. But just to reiterate to everybody, black has no useful move here. This rook on h6 is out of play. If I would try for the tactic, knight takes c3, saying, okay, your knight on, is pinned to your queen on f3, then white returns the favor with rook takes f7 check. If you simply move your king away and don't take, then I can bring my other rook to the seventh rank and I'm gonna mate you very quickly. If you take my rook, I have knight g5 check. Your king cannot go forward because the squares are under control by white's queen and knight. So if you go backwards, say to f8, then I take queen, and throw my rook down on b8 with a checkmate because your king's escape scores are all covered. If you go king to e8 instead of king to f8, it doesn't really matter because I can take on c6 with check, play f7 check, and then I want to go rook b8 with check and then force a queen on f8. So you're just losing no matter what. So really good game by Jan Elvis, one that I'm offering for game of the week con contention, mm -hmm. but I guess we should go elsewhere because the game is officially over. Yes, a beautiful finish in this game. And uh, Sergei Savitsky resigned because his position was hopeless and he clearly calculated all the tactical motives with Knight takes C3 and so on. I think definitely Jan Alves deserves a nomination for Game of the Week. And shout out, by the way, to everyone tuning in. We are almost 4,000 chess fans. This is the Proches League Week 5 broadcast, the Eastern Division. The Proches League is an online competition by chess.com, bringing in the top players of the world uh, representing their home countries, their their home cities, competing online in an eSport chess event where the finals will be held 
on location. We don't know yet where, but the dates are announced May the 4th and the 5th. So write it in your calendar because you will want to be there. Robert and I will be there. Alexandra, Danny Ranch, all the chess.com crew, we are going there. And we want you to visit us and see the second ever esports chess event in the world because the first one was last year and it, and it was epic. Yeah, for sure. No, I mean, you're you're right. And I was going to make a joke that if you're going to be there, then I'm not going to go. But of course, I'm. Oh. It, would, it would be so obviously just a lie that I couldn't even say it out loud. And I had to tell you what I was thinking because I'm an honest guy. But um, yeah. <laughs> and I see that people are saying Elvis has left the building. We just saw Jan Elvis win that game. It would be funny. I, I saw people laughing in the chat, but I've known Jan for a long time and played against him. So I've heard that joke many times. So I'm kind of at this point, you know, it's just it's lost its kind of hilarity to me, but that is a very great line for someone who hasn't heard it before. Elvis has left the building. Not Elvis Presley, but Jan Elvis. So, Jan Elvis, the great. He used to be one of the best players in the world. I think number three so in his So he belonged to the, the top 10 players. Um, and he's still, of course, a very strong grandmaster. Yeah, and you also, when you are a former you know, world top five, top three, I forget exactly what it was, you still have I that think experience. He was or, yeah, I mean, just a phenomenal player. And, and even once you lose some of your might, you still are able to play extremely high level chess. And we saw that there. And I, I pulled up the game between AD, that's Adiban Baskaran, and mm-hmm. Abhijit Gupta. That is a match between the Mumbai Movers, that's Adiban Baskaran, and the Delhi Dynamite, Abhijit Gupta. You can see their little logos next to their name. And Cash Mankey, what's it like to be such a Scrooge? Just call me Ebenezer from time to time. It's, it's all good. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I just had to. Just it just the Elvis thing. I've heard it so many <laughs> times. Yeah, um, but in this game here with Adiban and Abhijit, White is down a piece, right? But but White has three pawns for that piece. So that mm-hmm. trade off is very interesting. When we just talk in basic chess point language, that's about equal. It really depends on the position. But here we see that. Well, this pawn on d6 is very passed. If white can play e5 at some moment, then you'll have a nice protected pass pawn. Or maybe you want to play for the move f5 as white to attack this bishop because there will be some attacking chances. In fact, instead of king f2, f5 was extremely tempting. If you take on f5 and I put my bishop on d5 with check, your king already feels a little bit iffy because if it goes up to g7, you're working your way right into a pin. If it goes to h8, then maybe I can still pull my rook on e7 or get to the h file. So king f2, rook b6 was played, going straight after this pawn on d6. <laughs> and what shall I do now about the d6 pawn? Because that's obviously a precious piece. You don't really want to give it up. I would suggest rook d1 to protect it for now. And uh, if I can keep this pass pawn, the d6 pawn, obviously it's looking great. Yep. Even though even though the pawn is blocked, so it's not going to be easy to progress. But for now, white has more than enough compensation, I think, for the sacrificed piece. Yeah, it just, it's a matter of really a move-by-move move situation because black may play a4 at the right moment to attack the queen side and get this rook active via b2. As you mentioned, d6 now is clearly directly under threat. You can't go e5 because after pawn takes e5, you can no longer take back because the pawn f4 will be pinned to your king that just moved to f2. So maybe king f2 is a move that you, re- you regret, honestly, because it looked very good, but now e5 is not possible. Rook d1 is not the way you want to protect the pawn. It's, um, you know, rook behind a pass pawn sounds good, but it's a little bit passive, and I think black will try to counterattack with pawn to a4. I'm starting like black's position. Yeah, um, it does... It- does have uh, some venom still of course a piece up is a piece up i would suggest that we come back to this game uh, in uh, in a moment but i wanted to check out how the teammates of adiban and abijate are doing this is the all india derby mumbai movers versus a delhi dynamite okay and so far the match is pretty close it's one point up for the dynamite yep and so you wanted to go to the Hare krishna game is that the one you were looking at Yes. Okay, I'll go right there. Actually, Gupta did just make that pawn sacrifice, as mentioned before, with f5, and he's going right after this king. Ooh, rook takes c6. So before I was even able wow, to switch Wow, yeah, games. let's stay for a 95, moment. 93 check is coming. It, yeah, fork, fork, yeah. get your fork emotes out. Uh-oh. Fork. 
both rooks are under attack because the, the rook on c6 is immediately under attack. Knight d3 check is coming with a fork. That's why knights are so evil. They're so tricky, right? Just these knights are yeah. hard to deal with in a position like this. And look at that huge raid we just got here by whoa, Lex whoa, 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 whoa. Over 3,000 of you joining from Lex. Wow. Lex Belt, who shout out to Lex. Thank you so much for the raid. He's an amazing poker streamer and we love poker. I wish I could play proper poker. I still need to take lessons. I don't know how about you, Robert? How are your poker skills? But I think chess and poker go hand in hand and we do love the poker community so much. Thank you for joining us, guys. This is a pro chess wow. league with Robert Hess and myself. I mean, there's just so much going on the Twitch. I'm going to throw up the format real quick just explain to everybody but we have to stay with the chess but format first just remind everybody teams from five continents the time control is 15 minutes with a two second um, increment and it's a head-to-head -head match so we're watching Delhi Dynamite versus the Mumbai Movers everyone plays everyone from these teams and we will see here that um, these are all the teams across the league all their logos my favorite is the Moscow Wizards but got to get back to the chess the action is really heating up here and look at this position we have between Abhijit Gupta and Adi Bond Baskar. And it looks winning for Black. Black is up a bishop, right, Anna? And with this extra bishop, you say, well, White has two pawns over there on the queen side, but they're not far enough advanced. You need those that further up the board trying to promote because without that, it's going to be Black who's going to be pushing his pawns first. So a rook f3 check as one option. Well, if you go rook f3, then I move my king. And now b5 is actually a huge threat. So you have to be careful. Yeah, b5 and both rook take c6 would have been a threat. So black still has to be careful. There are tactical elements in the position. And also there's not much material on the board. So if you get rid of all the pawns, that would be a theoretical draw position. Black still has, of course, winning chances. And especially with the e5 pawn alive, this has to be a winning position. So that's a pass pawn for black that will be supported with the bishop and the rook. If you start pushing e4, e3, that's a potential queen. Black just has to make sure that white is not going to create any danger with his pawns. Right. So the A and B pawns will be also advancing. Uh, B6 is an option or A5, moving the rook away from A6 and then A5, A6. There are plenty of ways to try to push the queen side pass ones, but this should be a winning position for black and i just wanted to also highlight that the pro chess league is the first co online competition in the chess world that creates an esport chess event and the finals will be held on site in a location probably in the united states on may the 4th and the 5th so those of you joining us from the channel of flex if you want to see an esport chess event may the 4th and the 5th those are the dates it's going to be an epic event where the players will be facing each other sitting in front of each other but looking at computer screens with noise constantic headphones and you can be shouting cheering having a beer eating pizza i loved it last year and i'm going this year too robert will be there too Join us for the Pro Chess League Finals. Yeah, absolutely. You don't want to miss that. It was a lot of fun last year. It'll be even more fun this year. When the location is announced, we will let you know. But May 4th, May 5th, May the 4th be with you. So Yeah, I... that's a terrible pun that we have created here on our chess channels. But it's there. It's there. It's sticking. And that way, I think we can all remember that May the 4th is the date. If you guys have any questions, by the way, those of you joining from the community of Lex, let us know because we are happy to, of course, respond to any chess or non-chess related questions. If you are new to the chess world, this is one of the most exciting online competition with the top players in the world having their teams, their local teams, they are representing their cities facing each other in divisions that are divided by time zones so that no one has to play really late or really early in the morning. And we have some of the top players. Magnus Carlsen had a team, the world champion had a team last year. This year we have world number two, Fabiano Caruana, representing one of the American teams. And all the strongest players in the world basically want to compete in this online event. People are, are laughing at you because, not laughing at you, with you, because May the 4th be with you is like an old Star Wars pun. And so you, you said that, you know, it's in our chess community. And I know, I know what you meant. You meant that the, our dates just happen to line up with it. But it's a, yeah, it's a Star Wars pun that people are, the fans of Star Wars in the chat are getting uh, happy about. But someone asked a very good chess-related question. So I'm, I'm going to pick that one up. Is Black's time going to be an issue here? Because I know it's the 43 seconds left for Black. And the, the reason I'll say no is because there's a two-second increment. And Vindication, I see you went to my high school. What up? But the two-second increment means that you get two seconds after every move you make. So you can build up time on the clock. 
And here, with this epon rolling so quickly, it's going to be very hard for White to do anything. In fact, Abhijagupta is spending his time trying to come desperately find something that he can do. And the problem is, White is going to go, excuse me, Black is going to go e4. At some point, play bishop c4 check, where it hits the king on e2, and then helps this pawn keep pushing down the board. And White is going to try to do something, but let's say I go a5, I already have to calculate, is bishop c4 check simply winning this pawn on b5 as well? And bishops show their true strength in positions like this when there are not many pieces on the board because bishops cover so much space, so many uh, squares, and here bishop c4 take this pawn on b5, I think you can get away with it because and he did it, bishop b5, rook b6 was played, and now rook can come to b3, rook e6, rook b2 check. So he'll put a check in, he'll put his rook on e2 to protect this e5 pawn. So it looks like Adiban had this all worked out, he's playing very quickly here with rook b2 check, and now rook to e2, you're up a full piece. Yeah, I think we can switch to another board because this will be a victory for Adiban. Very well played by one of the top players of India, facing a friend of him, Abhijit and Adiban get on very well. But over the chessboard, there's no friendship outside the chessboard, of course. They are best friends. Uh, their teammates are also fighting. So this is the Mumbai Movers versus the Delhi Dynamites match. Uh, Harshit Raja is playing a night endgame versus Vyap Suri. They are also down on the clock. It's one minute for each player. Yeah. Uh, but it seems quite balanced, and they have just repeated moves, so it's a draw. Yeah, just to show everybody what that means is the knight went with check to d8, the king went to d, uh, e7. If you go to d6, so king d6 runs a knight f7 check, forking the king and some pawns. So you have to be careful before making a move like that because then you lose some material. So instead, at this point, went king to e7, knight b7, king back to e6. You want your king on e6 because white wants to play c5, and if I can play c5, c6, I'm starting to make huge progress on the queen side, but with my king on e6, as soon as you play c5, my king comes in the center with d5, hitting this pawn at c5 a second time, and gaining the opposition and a more advanced king. So that's why instead, they simply repeated moves with knight to d8 check and knight back, and black went king to e7 and to e6. Yeah, in the meantime, Ronak Sadvani, 13-year-old Ronak Sadvani beat Tarini Goyal. I think we could show the last couple of moves in that game because it was a very instructive attack by the 13-year-old boy. Um, I don't know if you have that yep, game, I Rupert. It up. For instance, from move 30, if we pick up uh, after queen e2, move 31, knight g2. Oh, they started a new game, so it went away. Oh, no. oh it's a pity, yeah. It has disappeared also from my I was screen. Just, I was just showing it and then new games appeared, so I lost yeah, it. Yeah, it happens that there's so many games going on in this competition that sometimes we can't just go and analyze slowly, but you guys can check any game by typing in slash follow hashtag PCL on chess.com. If Mubot could please send the instructions in the chat, that would be lovely. And once again, shout out to all of you joining from the channel of Lex. We do love poker and chess, the combination of the two. I have so many friends who are chess players and play poker or vice versa. They are poker players, but they love chess. I think these two communities are really brothers and sisters. Yep. No, you're absolutely right. And well, we literally have brothers and sisters on the Armenian Eagles team, right? We have Sean Sargisyan yeah. and so uh, Anna Sargisyan. So, but I, your point definitely holds throughout the entirety of the chess world. You know, people are there to support each other, to nurture, and to help the game grow. How are the brothers and sisters doing? Sean Sargisyan has been one of the top players of the Armenian Eagles, and he has been out upsetting all his opponents so far, but we don't consider them upset anymore because the guy is on fire. He wins game after game. Yeah, he does. And he's playing white against Dinara uh, Dorjieva. And when this game here, well, look at the pawn structure. Have you seen an, a pawn structure this ugly before? Um, no, not really. You might, <laughs> you might want to try to make it even worse. If the h6 pawn was on g5, that could be a little bit worse, but yeah, it's very ugly. And we call it ugly because the black pawns are isolated. They are not connected. You want your pieces to be friends. They want, you want them to be on the same team, helping each other. The pawns are not connected. That means that they are weak. They are vulnerable. They are not protecting each other. Right. 
Yeah, and the reason why is the pawn is the least valuable piece, right? And if your pawn is protecting another pawn, it makes it very hard to capture. So if you just look at this pawn on c4, right, you're never going to be able to take it with a piece as this d3 pawn protects it. So when you capture it, the pawn will capture you back, and you're losing a more valuable piece for the least valuable piece on the board. So king f6 was played. Okay, black's pawn structure is really hard to look at. I admit that. And the rooks are hard to look at because look at what white has done. This rook and bishop combination have made black's rooks very restricted. You can't go to the b8 square as I have two pieces covering it. You can't go to a7. My rook covers that. These rooks have no activity whatsoever. So if I'm uh, Sean Sargisian, I might just play rook f1 and pawn f4 in some order. Maybe pawn f4 first mm -hmm. to get some sort of progress. You can play king f3 to e4 as well to jump your king to the center. But... Yeah, it's, it's just a matter of time before white crashes through because black has nothing to do but just kind of sit and move back and forth. I love your idea with f4. Just open up the f5 to get access to this king on f6. Bring the bishop back after g takes f4, bishop takes f4. I think this position for black is a nightmare to play because of the very, very bad pawn structure and passive pieces. You look at the a8 rook, you look at the c8 rook. They are not doing anything. They are unemployed. Yep. And they're, yeah, they're just stuck. They're very much stuck here. So this looks very good for Sean Sergisian. We'll be back here to this game. I saw the game between Sanan Shagirov and um, Haik Martirosian. That's Mikatarid versus Sanan underscore Shugirov. And what I see that just happened was Brook takes bishop on e4. So he took this bishop on e4, giving up a rook for a bishop. Rook is more valuable. Played rook to f1. The queen could not capture on f1 because queen takes g7 as checkmate. And so you need to move your queen along the seventh rank here to protect the g7 square. Rook f4 played. And this goes to show that, yes, a rook is technically worth more than a bishop, but in this position, the bishop on e4 was very valuable. And it, in return, the bishop on e5 is essential to the attack because now this rook can come to g4, lining up more pressure. Why can you play h4, h5, h6 at some point to amp up the pressure as well? Rook g4 here. Rook takes e4, both possibilities. Um, looking like there's definite compensation, though if the queens get traded off the board, then black is happy to enter an endgame. So it's sort of a mixed bag at this point. Also, now rook f8, that's a very smart move to try to trade your rook. When you're an exchange up, and an exchange up means that you have a rook versus a bishop or knight. So it is a heavy piece versus a minor piece, and the rook is worth more than a bishop or a knight. So this is material advantage for black, and what he's doing that is really smart is trying to uh, trade one of the rooks and that will mean that if the white rook is off of the board there will only be one rook left and that is blacks this is a general strategy you should do when you're an exchange up because that will increase the power of your rook if your rook is the only rook on the board right. sounds very basic but we don't think about it when we play our games no you're absolutely right and just to show the example like if white plays rook takes e4 now this rook covers the entire fourth rank and so uh, the black rook can't move to the fourth rank unless another rook protects it. But if that rook was off the board, and if you, you know, trade on f8, okay, you took on e4, but if those rooks were traded, then this black rook could come to c4 and be unopposed. There would be no challenge for it because the rook against a bishop. So that's what Anna was highlighting, and it's a very good point. These things become second nature to us, but in the back of our heads and our subconscious, we still remember these things, and that's what leads us to know, okay, you want to trade off a pair of rooks if you're black here, but if you're white, you want to keep them on the board. And, of course, the attack is sort of raging on here, so that's another reason why white would like to use this rook to come over to g4 or to h4 at some moment to help out in the attack. Okay, queens were traded, but now a4 is falling, but you have to keep your rook protecting this bishop. So rook a4 doesn't work. That's why bishop f4 was played first. g5... Okay. Chase the bishop away and open the uh -oh. f5, but now the rook comes in from the queen side, rook b5, threatening rook to b2, rook 5 to b2 to attack the g2 pawn. Uh, he switches strategy to keep defending the g5 pawn and go for the a3 pawn. In this position, there are still some technical difficulties in, in how to convert it, but it is it should be a winning position because it's a rook versus a bishop and a pawn, and the rooks are very active. So it's yeah. about the activity of the pieces. The more active your pieces, the more powerful they are, and that increases their relative value. Yeah, and this pawn on e3 is very important because then black will have a pass pawn. 
So there's no way e to easily protect this pawn. Your bishop has no squares. D2 is covered. C5 is covered, which means rook G3 is the way to protect our E4. But now it's on a light square. So if I play rook to E5, I can just take this pawn E4 next. And then I say, all right, you may win my G5 pawn, but I have this past E pawn that can start rolling down the board. So it looks like a good trade-off for Hayek Martirosian with the black pieces here. Man, I envy so much everyone uh, coming up with uh, all the emo emotes, the amazing emotes that Lex has on his channel and trying to subscribe while I'm broadcasting, but it's not so easy to multitask because I want to use the emotes too. Like the bird emote is so cool and some other ones that I have just seen in the chat. And I was a subscriber on Lex's channel, but now I see that my subscription has expired, so I cannot use the emotes and I'm really upset. I'm trying to resub on air. <laughs> You can do it. I'll talk for a bit. Just, you know, babble on and you'll be able to resub. So get, get your resub going. I'll keep looking at these games here and then you let me know when you're back in action. But yeah, this game. Yeah, I'm, I'm here. I'm here. I I'm, I'm, I'm think I can handle it. Okay. I believe you. And I, and, and I believe in you. So it's just King F6 played. I don't, okay. Protecting this pawn, but I didn't really love the move King F6. Didn't think it was necessary. Rook d3, the pawn is protected. So now push that pawn. Keep pushing it. Go pawn e3. But this white pawn is rolling really fast as well. So it's an interesting dynamic here. The rooks, is, and this is what I was saying about the bishop, right? The bishop from, say, c3 will cover the entire length of diagonal. Rooks, on the other hand, sometimes they're worse than bishops, uh, especially in an endgame like this. But it's all about this e3 pawn. I think that. Rook d4 here will blunder, so don't do that because bishop c3 pins it. Just kidding. But I was going to say rook d to attack this pawn and maybe get to the g4 square. That would be nice, but mm -hmm. I'm just blundering pieces instead. Ha. Yeah, I guess um, for now to progress, he could remove the rook from e2 to push the pawn to e2. So the black pawn would be only one square away from promotion. You guys know that this pawn, it can become from the smallest and least valuable piece into the most powerful one. It can become a queen if it gets to the other side of the board. So e2, one square away from promotion. And um, But rook, what's next? Because the bishop and the rook are covering e1. Rook takes b4. Oh, rook takes b4 to then have two pass pawns. Yeah, because the rook is not going to be able to handle both of them. Oh, I love it. Rook takes b4. Let's show it on the board. Rook takes b4, a takes b4, a3. And that means that white has black has given up the rook, but he then has two pass pawns, and White cannot control both pass pawns with his rook. It has happened. Yep, it's happened. Sugarov will need to resign soon because he cannot stop both the A and the E pass pawns. What a beautiful finish. Yeah, and it just goes to show the problems of the rook, right? A rook, if it was on the first rank, it can stop both, but from behind, it can't catch both pawns. Now E2 comes, you can go back to E8, then A2, and you can't attack both of the pawns in this variation. So it wins by resignation. And if you had tried, say, to go rook f8 check, king moves rook f1, you are covering both queening squares. Then e2 will happen, and your rook, or a2 first, perhaps. And the point is that after rook to e1, I go e2, and then I have rook to d1, cutting your rook off from the promotion square on a1, and I will be able to queen. So that's a very instructive end game with the sacrifice. Rook takes b4. And instead of blundering the rook, I found a way to sacrifice the rook and win this game. So a very nice conclusion there and resignation. Beautiful, beautiful. And a very important point for the Eagles. Oh, Chesbay, thank you so much. I, I've been literally at the checkout entering my PayPal account. And at the same time, Chesbay has already gifted me a subscription to Lexus channel. Thank you so much, Chesbay. I need to use all those emotes. I've been, I've been so jealous of you guys with all the cool bird emotes. And also, like, I'm going to use now my favorite Lex emote. So this is one of my favorites. Also, of course, this is a really cool one, and the boom. We use so often the expression boom in chess as well, especially when something um, something happens on the board that is a tactical element and usually a sacrifice. So when it's a peace sacrifice, for instance, in order to attack the opponent's king, that's a boom moment in chess. Oh, and the coffee, of course. Yeah, I would need more. I've been having tea, but definitely crazy coffee man you are right <laughs> i've just been drinking water so is it where's crazy yeah, water i'm drinking boy? water too it's really hot in chile and oh thank you i'm so happy now with my emotes i'm gonna be i'm gonna be emoting in the chat all the time i mean it's good to show your emotions on us so emote away emoting away and i'm getting hungry too yeah me too but so I, yeah i'm trying <laughs> not to think about my hunger it's mm. 
So yeah, so far, if we look at the scoreboard that you can see right below, the Armenia Eagles are about to win the match versus the Moscow Wizards. They are one point away. So when a team hits eight and a half points, that is team victory already. Uh, but the Pro Chess League is not only about the match victory the game points also matter. So one thing is to win the match and another is how many points you can add to your team victory. That is, the Armenian team will still try to collect more victories. The Tbilisi gentlemen, they are the leaders of the Eastern Division. They are the only team that, that have collected more than 100 points in four weeks. That's lots of points in chess. And they are about to win yet another match against the Stormbringer. So these two teams, the Tbilisi gentlemen and the Armenia Eagles are the current leaders and they are on their way to secure their top spots with yet another victory. Yeah, I pulled up the standings there and just uh, behind them is the Mumbai Movers, right? They're very close to the Armenia Eagles, but they're in a dead heat against the Delhi Dynamite, right? The Indian, all India battle, the Indian Derby is in its final round. Remember, there are four players in every team, just to reiterate this, four players in every team. You play all four players in the enemy team, so that means you play 16 total games as a team, right? Four times four. So it's six to six, 12 games in play. The final four games are underway. And that means board one versus board one, board two versus board two, three versus three, and four versus four. So the final round, we're going to have to keep our attention on this match because it's tied up. The Armenian Eagles are, as you mentioned, are really pulling away. The gentlemen are not being so gentle with the Stormbringers. And so they are about to win their match as well. But let's go to the Indian Derby. And I looked at this game between Adiban and Hare Krishna, and I am excited about this position because black is even a material, even though oftentimes you see a position like this, you're, mm -hmm. you know, you're down a pawn because the king looks exposed on G1. It's missing a G pawn, right? If you could put this A pawn, I do this a lot. If you could put this A pawn on G3, of course you're attacking the black queen on H4, but more importantly, yeah. your king feels safer without this open file. On the flip side, this bishop on g2 has no counterpart, right? So it, it controls the light squares. The knight on a5 looks awkward. The bishop on c5, knight d5, this kind of combination of pieces. a3, b4 comes to mind. Pawn to c4 for white to kick this knight away from d5. All of these are options that look very pleasant for Adiban in a position like this. Yeah, I, I always say that when you when you want to detect tactical elements in a position, that is, I think, one should do it every single move to see if there's something... That, First of all, observe which pieces are undefended. So I'm looking at the a5 knight being an unprotected piece, the c5 bishop 2 and the e5 pawn. And therefore, I was trying to find if there's a way to push b4, but that square is controlled. And then I switched to looking at moves like queen e1, which would attack both the knight and the pawn at the same time. And I don't really see how can black get away with that. Queen e1 is actually a really good looking move on it. I mean, it just seems, what do you do after queen e1? Um, White is going to get the pawn with a check on e5, and that is trouble because the e5 opens up with the king in the middle of the board. If White can open up the position, that is in this case the e5 to attack the e8 king, I think it's going to be really problematic. So it's a pawn, it's going to be a pawn up for White and attack on the e5. Right, and actually queen e1, I think maybe bishop d6 is going to be the response, trying to spy on the h2 pawn. So if you take my knight, then I go e4. Something like this at least gives some chances, but then the simple h3 looks like it takes care of business here. Just play h3, your king is now much safer because this queen can't jump over the pawn, the h2 square, and it doesn't look like white, excuse me, black is quite enough for the attack. Just seems like white is getting out of this up a minor piece. So knight d2. Yeah. Your queen Oh, I'm looks... trying to come up with my my emote game, but I, I'm not very good at multitasking and I, I misspelled the emote. I was going to write unprotected the same way as camel culture. I need to learn from you guys how to do it properly. I'm not as pro at emoting as I used to be at chess. So if you look at our titles, by the way, that was a question in the chat. Robert, can you explain what is GM in front of your name? GM? It means that... Yeah. Uh, why, why your name is GM? It means good morning, Robert Hess. I'm trying to <laughs> give myself the energy needed when I commentated last night from, I don't know, what time was I working from? 8.30 until like 12.30. Yeah. And then I was up doing this. You know, we were on a call earlier than 9 a.m. So GM is good morning. No, it means grandmaster is the highest <laughs> title in chess. So that is why the GM letters are in next to my name. Joe Bruin, thank you. I'm not a gem, 
but appreciate the he support. He is a anyway. gem, oh. and my one doesn't say that I'm Anna Rudolph, which I am, but I am in chess stands for International Master. That's another title, the title below Grandmaster. And uh, we both have been competing basically our whole life. Robert is still an active player. He he competes, he trains, he commentates. I have retired. I was on the Olympic team of Hungary, but now I'm just enjoying my retirement, being a commentator and reporter at chess events. Yeah, you're like the hardest working person in chess. So. By the way, click on, click on my face if you want to check out our channel because we both have our own channels here on Twitch. And if you click here with the mouse, you can find out more about Robert and me on our own channels. We're gonna be streaming basically in the coming weeks. I have a stream tomorrow too with your good friend, Robert. I'm streaming tomorrow with John Urschel, mathematician and former NFL player. Is tomorrow Friday? Yeah, it's already Friday tomorrow. I've lost track of day of the weeks because I know Ursha learns chess on Fridays. And so I was thinking, wait, tomorrow, isn't that like Tuesday? But no, tomorrow's Friday, which I'm happy about because most people, not in the chess world, they work a typical work week. And so my roommate, for example, he is free <laughs> in the, on the weekends. So thankfully I will get to you know, hang out with my friends this weekend, but I just, it's been a long week, that's for sure. Whew. Chess, chess, <laughs> chess, 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 please a link to Hikaru's channel. You should, if you are new to the chess world, check out Hikaru Nakamura. You will be blown away with his chess skills. Top player in the chess world and an amazing streamer on Twitch. Yep. He's takes, takes, takes. Takes, 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 mate. Oh, I was actually going to say takes, takes, G -G. takes. GG, GG. Takes, 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 <laughs> takes your booty. I, <laughs> and in this case, booty is a nice double entendre because it's like, you know, booty is like treasure. And so in Puzzle Rush, all right, that sounded really inappropriate. I'm going to take it all back. I'm just going to go to the chess <laughs> again. But so I'm going to Muhammad uh, Sheikh's game against Abhijit Gupta. Abhijit with the black pieces has a bad pawn structure, but has activity and compensation. So um, what in the I'm going to use my text emotes too. Takes, takes, takes. I love, I love the song, Robert. And Gigi, yo, good game. <laughs> yeah, I see that. It looks good. Um, yeah, people, you know, so unprofessional. Okay, I gotta, I'm usually this very serious one. People tell me to smile more. So, you know, I gotta smile. You gotta right? leave it to Robert. He, he's such a I fun shaved, guy. I Let shaved. him be himself. Let him be himself. Yeah, I, I'm, my maturity dipped along with my level of beardiness. So, <laughs> all right. So, chess, Muhammad Sheikh with the white pieces, down four minutes on the clock. His position. I don't love the fact that this knight is just hopping into d3, but I don't love black's double pawns on c6 and c4 either. But queen d2 was played. The more adventurous queen a4 was certainly an option to come after some of these black pawns. But it's like queen d2, the very calm move, keeping all of white's pawns protected. d4 has an extra defender. b2, oop, I'm trying to draw that arrow. I'm struggling. b2 is still protected, so knight d3 doesn't have as big of a threat. Can you explain how teams are restricted to signing players only in their area other than one recruit? Okay, Imperial Soldier is a great question. You can mm -hmm. sign teams from anywhere in the world, but you can only play one of those free agents in a week. And the reason why it doesn't hurt teams is because you, you know, these teams are qualified, right? La you, the bottom two teams in every division, here, let me pull up the standings really quickly and then we'll get back to the chess. The bottom two teams in every division get relegated. And they can try to qualify again the next season. So that is Moscow, Ljubljana, Pittsburgh, San Diego uh, before this week. Those teams were all in relegation territory, kind of like the Premier League in football, right? You, all the Europeans were happy that I said football mm -hmm. and not totally. soccer. Totally. Well done, Robert. I, we love you. I would take a bow, but I'm on camera and I don't want to move from my very comfortable position here. But yes, so the teams get relegated, which is what keeps them in the league. These teams have good players. Armenia is a small country in terms of population but very talented chess players throughout that country. So it's not going to harm them too much. I hope that was a good way of summing that up. I see Danny Wrench is here. Hey, Danny. Yeah, shout out to Danny Wrench, the man behind chess.com, and he has subscribed to his own channel. Well done, Danny. 
Yeah. Also, once again, a huge thanks to Lex, Lex Fat, who's an amazing poker streamer. He has, he has come to our stream with um, a rate of 3,300 chess and poker fans out there. If you are a poker player, poker fan, welcome. If you have never seen a chess broadcast, this is the best online chess competition that has been created by chess.com, the Pro Chess League. It's an eSport chess event, and we are covering it every single week. We love both the poker and the chess community. As I said earlier, I think they are brothers and sisters. So many similar strategies between these two games. And I have, as I said, chess friends who have become poker players or poker players who are now switching to chess or they play both. These two worlds, uh, I think they are colliding all the time. Yeah, for sure. And there's a lot of respect from poker players to chess players and from chess players to poker players. So you're definitely correct. And um, well, speaking of respect, I got to give respect to Adiban and Hare Krishna. They are the top players for the Delhi Dynamite and Mumbai Movers, respectively. Okay, during the rest of the season, you will see Vida Gujarati play for the Movers, and he's obviously an elite player. But don't count Adiban out here. And with the white pieces, he is up a pawn. One of these pawns is passed on c6 here and look at the last move that was played bc6 for mm. white and rook to b8 actually rook b8 to c8 for black and the reason why that's important is your rook is under attack on the b8 square if black had played rook takes b1 then white can even take back with the knight so i don't lose my knight on c3 because i recapture on b1 with my knight i still have this pass c pawn protected by my bishop on f3 that's looking like a very good situation for Adiban. So instead he went rook to c8, saying your knight is still under attack on c3. Now I'm gonna gobble up your pawn on c6. And once I take this pawn on c6, in fact, it's white's pawns that are weak. The pawn on c5 quickly becomes a target rather than a strength. The d4 square is one the knight can hop into. So bishop d5 check thrown in, but the simple king move. I would say king, where's that king going on? h8 or h7? Uh, Robert, I don't know where the king is going, but I have managed to fix my camera. <laughs> I've been, I haven't realized that I've been using the mirror image for the whole time. That's why you could not read pro chess on my really nice red polo, the pro chess league uniform. Um, now, now I'm normal, Anna. So that's me without the mirror effect. Hey. <laughs> uh, I, I don't even know what happened, but. Has it, hasn't it changed? I think I see it now normally. Don't you see the pro? No, it's still, is it still, still mirror? Uh, no? I think you're still mirror. I thought, I thought I managed to flip it. Isn't it flipped? I was so proud of myself for fixing this technical part. You're still mirrored. That's what everyone's telling you. Am I? And people are saying, Why? Anna through the looking glass. I love it. I love mm. that. That was a great comment by Diagonally. I see myself normally. I don't understand. I see now the pro chess letters normally, but I tried, guys. I tried. It's okay. It's probably because we're like midstream and the camera doesn't want to mess anything <laughs> up. But... Yeah, I think regardless, mirror image or not, I'm just happy you've joined me today for the commentary because, you know, it's a fun fun event. I love the Pro Chess League. It's just so exciting, these teams from around the world competing in, in groups of four, and it's just fun stuff here. But this match... So much fun at the Pro Chess League, yes. And six, Robert, six. I am always honored to be sitting next to you, whether virtual, virtually or physically, because a few weeks ago we did sit next to each other with Robert, literally in the same room now we are well a continent apart from each other but it happens in online world yep yep for sure and uh, you know we did our last commentary together live from Wykenze in the netherlands we were doing tata steel chess commentary and we overlapped and did commentary together so uh, you're right sometimes it's virtual other times it's sitting next to one another but the pleasure is still always mine here. And so what game should we no, look the at? Pleasure, the pleasure is mine. I, and I just got to respond to a question in the chat that was about when we're going to stream next. Uh, I want to ask Robert, uh, will you be streaming, Robert, in the coming days? Shall we announce the stream? I, or when can people follow you on your channel? I want to stream starting next week, but I just need my templates mm -hmm. to be all up to date and things like that. But I do absolutely want to stream. You'll be seeing more of me. Sorry for those of you who don't want to see me. Yay <laughs> for those of you who, for some reason or other, support me. So we'll be joining more on Twitch in the upcoming weeks for sure.
Yeah, and, and you will see a lot of me too this week and the coming weeks because tomorrow I'm streaming with John Urschel, former NFL player and mathematician. And on Sunday, I'm going to be streaming on my own channel. So every Sunday, I will be playing with subscribers to my channel. And also, I think puzzle rush time. It should be puzzle rush time. So Sunday will be stream time on my channel. And I usually tweet before the stream the time I'm going to be live. And this Sunday, a special feature that I will be streaming with the chess singer, Huga, my best friend who I'm hanging out with here in Chile, obviously. And she will be singing live on air while I'm playing. So that is happening on Sunday. <laughs> that sounds awesome. I can't wait for that. I'll definitely tune into that. Uh, but I just tuned into the Round of Sedwani game where he went Bishop takes D4 against Suri Vipov. And that is a, looks like a peace sacrifice, but really what's happening is once pawn takes d4, knight takes d4, I get a second pawn, and importantly, I fork the queen and the rook, and I have control over the c-files black. The minor pieces are actually going to be worse than a rook with these open lines. So bishop takes d4 is a very nice tactical shot played by Sadwani. You'd hope as white to play bishop takes d6, and after queen takes d6, mm -hmm. play knight b5, forking queen and bishop. But the problem is, after bishop takes d6, I can throw in bishop takes c3 as an intermediate move, and say that, well, now I took your knight, I'm threatening you to take your bishop back here, but I'm still not positive about this. Bishop to a3 is a response is possible here. There's going to be some pressure down the c file, so I'm not sure at the end of this who this is going to favor, but I do like the bravery, the courage here to make this bishop takes d4 move, and I think it's good. It looks good to me too. And once again, 13 year old Ronak Sadvani is fearless. He almost beat Vichy Anand in the chess.com I Love Man tournament a few months ago. If you guys haven't seen that game, check it out because Ronak was on his way to beat his role model, Vichy Anand. Every Indian child who starts playing chess starts by studying the games of Vishy Anand. He has been the inspiration for an entire generation of new chess players in India. And Ronak, 13-year-old Ronak, almost beat him a few months ago in classical chess at the board. Yeah, he's a phenomenal talent, and he's putting that to show here with Bishop takes d4. So this game is, again, very essential. Look at the standings underneath us. If you look underneath us, there is the mm -hmm. current standings of the Eastern Division. Uh, sorry, the not standings, but the results of today's matches. 6-6 mm -hmm. six, six tie right now between Mumbai and Delhi. The first team to 8.5 points wins. And so this would be a huge upset for Ranak Sedwani because his opponent is 150 points high rated and he has the black pieces. So let's see how the other games are faring because this is just one of four essential games for this match. So Bishop takes C3. Okay, we saw this and we expect... Bishop a3 is exactly what I was talking about. If bishop to b4, then his bishop might come to b2 and make use of the long diagonal. This king might feel very unsafe if the bishop and queen can line up and form a, a uh, what's that called? Queen and bishop battery on the mm -hmm. long diagonal there. So what remains to be seen, but let's hop on over to Torini Goyal with the white pieces against Harshit Raja with the black pieces because mm -hmm. there is a battery there, exactly what I was talking about, with queen and bishop on a8 yeah. and b7. So if you move this pawn from f3, that queen will land on h1 very quickly. So that's something that you have to be on the lookout for. That's very important, this detail that once the f3 pawn disappears, queen h1 is coming. That's why 9g4 was played a move earlier. So if we go back to move 23, yep. white pushes f3 to cover the long diagonal, prevent queen h1 mate. And 9g4, a very strong move because in case of a capture, there's queen h1 coming up next. Yeah. It's not a mate in this very moment. Queen h1 is a check, but after king f2, queen takes h2, a king e1, you can take on g3 oh. as well with a check. This has to be made shortly. Yeah, at the very least, you're mopping up all the pawns here because g4 will fall next with check as yeah. well. Yeah, this would be a very bad situation. So instead of taking, so don't think that your pawn just blundered a piece, right? So knight g4 wasn't, mm -hmm. oh, I just hung my knight, please take me. It's, well, it was, a, it was a fake out. It was a bishop d4 simultaneously attacks the rook on b6 and protects this pawn e3. And if I'm black, I'm playing c5 here. Just, I mean, full steam ahead. c5 attacking this bishop on d4. The bishop is needed to protect both the e5 and the e3 pawns. And if that bishop is removed, say after bishop c5 takes rook c5, then all of a sudden knight takes e3 comes attacking the rook on d1. Mm -hmm. So instead he took on a3. Okay, that makes a lot of sense as well. 
hitting this rook. Yeah, now both rooks are in the air. So instead of moving her rook, uh, uh, instead of moving his rook, he now plays bishop takes a3, and Tarini will need to decide whether she wants to take on b6 or move her rook away from c1. Um, this is looking really good for black. Yeah, this would be a nice win for Mumbai, but this is ex kind of expected, right? Because Torini, while she's a very talented yeah. player, she's outrated by 337 yeah. points in this game. So, um, yeah. you know, you, you... This is what we said, that uh, each team has a different strategy and uh, it's not clear what is better. Uh, the rules don't allow the four players having more than 2,500 as a rating average. So in chess, there's a rating which shows the strength of the player and to make this competition more balanced there's a rule that doesn't allow the team to have a rating average above 2500 but this means that some play some teams have a very ba balanced lineup with four players being on similar strength or three of the players being very similar uh, on the mumbai movers they have a very strong board four that is the player with the black pieces here, Harshit Raja, 2,400. That's a very high rating for a board four. And Tarini Goyal is the board four of the Dynamites. Almost, uh, well, it's about uh, 350 rating points difference right. between the two players. And that's because the Dynamites are higher rated on board two and board three. Yep. And I just pulled up the game with Abhijit Gupta to emphasize that point. 2443 for white and 2588 for black. And Anna, I have to ask you, because I came up with this last night with Levy. Can you make a hungry team and you play with the three Polgar sisters? Oh, I would love to, but I'm afraid would that uh, they have retired just like I have. But if Judith and her sisters would come back to chess, they would still be, I think, the strongest ever team, even if they haven't trained for years because they have been just such an epic Team and Judith Pogar, the strongest female player of all time. If you haven't heard of Judith Pogar, she is amazing. She has been leading the female rank ranking for 25 years, and she stopped competing in women's competitions at the age of 12 because she was just clearly the best. She wanted to be a world champion, overall world champion, and she got to be the world number eight. Being top 10 in the world is really tough in chess to get into the top 10. And she belonged to the elite chess world for years. Uh, she's one of my idols and friend at the same time. So I'm very, I'm very lucky to be working with Judy. So, but I'm afraid that she doesn't want to compete. She is promoting chess in different ways. Chess education, uh, using chess as an educational tool and her global chess festival to connect the chess world through chess. I don't know. I love this idea. I think you shouldn't shoot it down so quickly. Come on, let's make it happen. Come on, Ooh. make it happen. <laughs> but also, Abhijit Gupta. Yeah, they, they can be playing. I will be uh, commentating. Oh, come on. You would play <laughs> for that team. I know you would. You would enjoy it. It'd well, be a great if, honor. If they, if they played, of course, I would love to. Yeah, but... I'm going to make this happen. But right now, I'm, I am looking at Abhijit Gupta's game because he won a piece. Mm -hmm. So, Mohammed Sheikh with the white pieces has lost a piece. And in fact, he's going to lose the game any moment now. And what happened was... Gupta went c3, so these ugly double pawns started actually pushing down the board. And after knight c3, knight d3 came four king, queen, and bishop. And queen b1 was, well, that's an error, I guess, but you have no real choice because queen e1 mate would be the move if you move the queen off the back rank. So I guess queen a3 protecting the knight was stronger. But after queen b1, knight c5, now you have this knight on c3 hanging. And after knight takes d5, thinking you're getting out of it, queen d5 pins the pawn to the knight on d2. So in fact... Black just simply won a minor piece in this position, and Abhijit Gupta, well, he's just traded off the queens, easily winning endgame up a knight, excuse me, a bishop for just one pawn. Yeah. Game over. So that's a huge win for Delhi to go to seven to six. Um, very important, very important since this match has been tied. And in the meantime, the Armenian Eagles have won their match against the Moscow Wizards. You see that the score is already eight and a half for the Eagles. Eight and a half is the mark. So. 8-8 eight, eight would be a tie. That's the maximum point. We are dividing 16. And 8.5 and is a team victory already for the defending champions, the Armenia Eagles from Yerevan. Yeah, no, they're, they're a very good team. And, well, they're going to be happy if Mumbai goes down because Delhi um, is behind them in the standings. Mumbai was neck and neck with Armenia heading into this match. And I pulled up the game between Adiban and Hari Krishna because, okay, we keep talking about Mumbai and Delhi. This pawn move to d5, that's a really nice shot because if you take on d5, then there's going to be some, like knight takes d5, rook d4 comes in, hitting your bishop and your knight. You think you're going knight c3 to win my rook on b1, 
But then I even have move rook takes d2, knight takes b1, and rook d7 check, forcing the rooks off the board and allowing my pawn to promote. Just to end this here, you can't stop me from queening. So it looks like after d5, bishop f4 was played to avoid all this stuff, but rook takes e4 is played. Yeah, indeed. Threatening the bishop, and the bishop cannot abandon the b8 h2 diagonal because d6 would be a fork, winning more material. This is a game between two of the top players from India. They are both on the Olympic team of India in classical chess, and now you're witnessing their derby, the match between the Mumbai Movers and the Delhi Dynamites. As I mentioned, most of these players are good friends. Also, Adiban and Hari Krishna get on very well. But over the chessboard, in a chess game, there's no such thing as friendship. So they go for each other's throats. Yeah, absolutely not. No friendship here. And g5 was played. So what is the response that's best? Um, OK, now I have to protect my d-pawn. So rook d1 looks sort of logical, right? Just mm -hmm. protect this pawn. Um, what else can be played here? Rook takes um, f4 has to be considered, just because rook f4, g4, d6, four king yeah. pieces, but then rook c6, pawn seven, rook e6 comes just in time, or does it? Rook b7? If you go king g6, then I have rook b6 here, pinning your rook and getting a queen. But hmm. you just have king g8 barely in time here because your king will come to f7 and gather back this e7 pawn. So it's very, very close to just being winning on the spot, but it looks like... Rook takes that for his own, the board has just been played by AD, and we shall see if he will follow up with D6, Rook takes C6, D takes C7, Rook E6, the line that Robert has yep. just showed. Here it happened. He's done it. In fact, he's doing it because the pawn endgame is winning. So what's going to happen is yeah. Rook E6, Rook B7, King G6, I mentioned Rook B6 happens, pinning your Rook. Uh, well, you take my Rook, I get a Queen. Thank you. And if you go King G8, then I go rook b8 check, king f7, e8 equals queen. We trade on e8, and then I go king g2, king f3, and take on f4, transition into an easily winning king of pawn game. So I'm going to make sure to keep up with this rook g6 check, king f1, rook g8 is defensive. But now you're in an equally lost position, king g2 to f3, and you can't actually get this pawn back because if we trade rooks, you're in a losing endgame. So very nicely done by Adiban here. And it's such an important point because the dynamites were up a, a point for a moment, then the movers have tied. So with this victory, the movers can take the lead, get eight points. And if in the remaining game, they achieve half a point, that is a draw, they have won the match. So I'm curious how the other position is because Adiban is going to win this. Okay, so who uh, is the last? Who else is playing? I um, need to check. Sur uh, sorry, by V Surrey 97. Oh, yes. And we just saw Adiban win this game. Hare Krishna resigns, throws in the towel because he has to move his king back. And I take this pawn. If you move your rook anywhere, then I get this queen. And my rook on e1 protects on e8. So that would be game over on the spot. A nice win for him. Surrey vibe hop. Very impressive. Very impressive uh, with the rating difference between the two players. Uh, that's quite significant on such high level. Uh, well done for Adiban, and we shall see if his teammate, Ronak Sadwani, can make at least a draw. I think he's doing very well yeah. to achieve half a point and win the match for his team, the Mumbai Movers. In fact, he can't possibly lose this game. It should be winning, I think, Rook B2. That way, at B5, you can always take it, but Knight A5 is coming, right? That's the point, is I need to get my... Knight A5, Knight B3, yes. Yeah. So Knight takes B4 should just be an immediate draw, and if he... I hope he knows the match score. I don't know if he does, but... Yeah, it's, it's, it will be interesting to know some of the players team, some of the, these teams play on a physical location altogether, others play from their homes. And in that case, they should be connected through a messenger Skype type of uh, group. But when you have only a few seconds left on the clock, you don't have time to WhatsApp your friend and ask the score. Yeah, no, it's, it's true, right? You can't just go grab your phone and be like, hey, buddy, what's the score <laughs> of our match? You should always be on the lookout, but they are aware of the score and... They tell the managers are always informed. That's the nice thing. Yeah. Greg Shahadi, the commissioner of the Pro Chess League, everyone give him a clap. He um, does a great job of keeping everyone informed at all times. And he has all the managers on speed dial. So if someone's disconnected, you know, you don't just want to forfeit somebody. You want to be like, hey, what's going on? Did you know something happen? Just in case they're not even aware they were disconnected from the server. So um, this game is going to be peter out into a draw because White cannot make any progress because this rook will just sit on the seventh rank. Okay, you can consider trading, but the problem with trading is that white's pawns are more advanced, 
So if you imagine the rooks off the board, the king will go mm -hmm. on a journey and they drew by repetition. But I can show that really quickly. If you and that is a very important half a point. Now the Mumbai Movers have won the match versus the Delhi Dynamites in the All India Derby. Well done to the Mumbai players. Yep, absolutely. And I'll just show the uh, final point that's worth making about this end game and why he didn't trade rooks. It's still likely, um, you know, should be a draw. But let's say this white king starts getting in the position here. At a certain point, as I just throwing on the board here with the king on g7 and king on e7, your king can no longer keep the pawn on f6 protected. The pawn on h5 does really well to keep the king away from g6. And so something like this would just be scooping up pawns and a winning king at pawn endgame. Of course, black could play better, but this is why you keep the rooks on the board just so you never even have to think, well, where does my king belong against the enemy king? So a nice way to finish this game uh, for Sadwani and the movers. Congratulations to them. And with this match over, eight and a half, seven and a half, we can jump to the Moscow Phoenix Estonia horses. They're 6-6. Six, six. But of course, the Armenian Eagles are still playing, as are the gentlemen of Tbilisi. So where do we go from here? Yes, indeed. Uh, I just see a question in the chat if Alexander Grishuk is playing. Of course, we, we are all fond of Alexander Grishuk and his humorous interviews. He doesn't have a team in the Proteus League yet, but the teams can still register new players. So I would love to see one of the teams getting Alexander Grishuk on board. But he did play in the title Tuesday on chess.com. So do check out. Grishuk and his games on chess.com. I wish he started streaming. We did, we did ask him the question in Isle of Man if he was going to stream on Twitch. But so far, he said that he's just getting used to technology and using WhatsApp. So he will need to catch up with modern world and maybe then start streaming. Yeah, he just gets used to technology. He goes nine and a half out of 10 in the title Tuesday. <laughs> Casual, right? I wish that's me getting Casual. used to technology. <laughs> it's like, oh, I just learned how a computer works. Oh, and now I'm the CEO of Apple. Right, just yeah. So sort of how that works for him. But, totally. Uh, and another player that I'm hoping to convince to have her channel is my my good friend Sopiko Gramish Williams Tactics. Robert and Sopiko have done an amazing job covering the Tata Steel Chess Tournament in Waikanzi, the second half of the event. And my task for this year is to actually convince Sopiko that she should start a Twitch channel and then make it a family Twitch stream, the Geary family streaming all together. That would be awesome. Yeah, that would be great. She's great. We had a great time commentating together in Waikanze, but yeah, we'll see if that happens. And uh, speaking of Georgia, that's where Sopiko is from, her country um, com compatriots, that's the word I was looking for. I was like, Country Patriots, that doesn't work. No, our compatriots <laughs> here. Um, here are the Tbilisi gentlemen. Bador Jabawa is the black pieces against Dmitry Andrekin. Andrekin, one of the favorite online speed chess players, playing many title Tuesdays, won so many of these events, and I love his position in this endgame here. Yeah. He's got the initiative on the queen side, very nicely plays knight on d4. He has just pushed a5 to break through on the queen side to capture on b6 and open the a5 or, or a6. And then the a7 pawn is a permanent target. Yeah, I mean, even the move knight c6 here, you're inviting that because it attacks your rook. And I'm wondering mm -hmm. if you move your rook to a8, if I take on a7, rook is play pawn takes b6. Does something like this work where my pawn is very far advanced? Looks like it at least is worth um, double checking to see if this might pan out for Andrake in here. Yeah, this is going to be a difficult position for Badu Jarbava to defend. You are now seeing that the board one clashes. So the pro chess league is about the teams, every player on each team facing the other players from the team four versus four. That's why there are four rounds in each match. And the last round in every match is when the players board one versus board one, board two versus board two and so on, face each other. The top players here, you see. Uh, Dimitri Andrakin rated over 2,700, which is a super, super grandmaster, and Badur Javava being the number one player of Georgia. He's got a very entertaining style. Javava, I think, has lots of fans because of his really original play. He likes offbeat openings and going for attacking positions. But here, he's on the defensive, and he will have to try to save half a point. Yeah, no, for sure. It looks really bad for him. Not his style of position, like you said. He is a very interesting, entertaining, enterprising player who loves sacrificing things. He had that amazing Olympiad in 2016 where he won a gold medal because he was just playing phenomenal chess. His win over Ruslan Ponomaryov comes to mind. So, um, yeah, he's, he's an exciting player. But right now his position is anything but exciting because it's just w much worse for black 
that the, if you ever move this knight, the rook infiltrates via c7. If you don't move the knight, you can never take on a5 and try to relieve some of the pressure on the queen side. So it looks difficult for him. But has his team, no, they have not won the match yet, still going on. So we should check out the other boards because this looks like a win in the making yeah. for Volga. Still plenty of work to be done. But it's looking so the storm bringers can still surprise the gentlemen. The gentlemen need one point to win the match. One point out of four games, which is, a, of course, a very good chance. I'm not a poker player yet, but <laughs> I, I think that would be very good odds that you only need to score one point out of four games. And uh, this is the situation here, but the storm bringers can make it if the other boards are doing as well as their top board. Uh, well, their board for Nico Volko's position doesn't look ideal at least from my perspective, it's even material, but black has the two bishops, the white king is in worse shape, a move like bishop to e5 and then queen to h8 comes to mind as a potential threat. Mm -hmm. The b4 pawn's already hanging if you want to capture that. Looks very promising for Alexei Ivlev for the Stormbringers, mm -hmm. and that would be two important games for them, for the yeah. Stormbringers. And what, let's see, we gotta keep going around here. I see Luka Paichadze with the white pieces against Mikhail Bryakin, and Bryakin also looks better with the black pieces in this game because he's, wow. he's a little more active. <laughs> They've been repeating if moves. They can, if they can turn the tables coming back from this situation, it's seven and a half, four and a half. So the Stormbringers are trailing three points behind the Tbilisi gentleman. That, that could be the biggest upset wow. that we have been witnessing these past matches. Yeah, look at Bryakin. Instead of making a draw, he plays... Rook, he repeats the rook g4 one more time and plays d3, saying, please take me on d3, because rook d3, rook d3, queen d3, rook takes g2 with check, and this king, if it survives, will have to go on a, a run to the queen side, in which case I think black is going to start mopping up some material over here on the king side. So this is a nice move, d3. If that pawn gets to d2, you're really hopeless in a position like that. The queen will protect it, the rook will protect it from behind, and a rook does love being behind the passed pawn. I see John Urschel in the chat. John. Wow, shout out to John Urschel. He is my other favorite co-host, Robert. I, you, you two uh, are such good friends and I love streaming with both of you. John Urschel is a former NFL player, mathematician. He is a legend. You guys should give him a follow because he streams on Twitch as well. And tomorrow I'm going to be streaming with him. Every Friday we have a show that's called Urschel Learns Chess, hanging out with John. And we will be looking at one of his new openings, I believe. But we got to discuss that. John, if you want to switch topic or shall we stick to the very exciting opening that is the Berlin defense. But we also study middle games and we play against followers and subscribers of John's channel. Yeah, John. John's a good guy. And I can't compliment him too much on stream because he knows that our f very close friendship is me kind of being you know, a little challenging and difficult. But yeah, <laughs> John, I saw you texting me. Thanks for the, the text there, I see it. Um, but does anyone know the next tournament Robert Hess is playing in? Robert Hess doesn't even know what the next tournament he's playing in is. So remains to be seen. But okay, this game between Luca Paisazzi it looks like Mikhail Bryakin, he needs to get a piece to the back rank. Rook c4 to c1 comes to mind as an option, right? Just trying to figure out the right square. But then I'm worried about my diagonal, right? If my rook's on c4, queen to b3 or something like that will be problematic for my now loosened king. E. And Robert just silently pulling up the favorite emote of his. The bagel, the bagels are in the chat. Get some bagel love for Robert his favorite snack, and uh, I just paired it with Danny Ranch because I think that emote almost looks like the bagel emote, Danny Ranch with his OMG look. Yep, and I'm sorry, I'm just trying to check out the right remaining remainder of these games here. Dmitry Fralyanov with the white pieces against Levan Pansulaya. Something is going on, and it doesn't look great for Pansulaya because mm. knight c7 check was played, opening up this attack on the knight on c6 as well. So if you play king d7, a move like rook b to d1 with check, you're having trouble protecting all your pieces here. Knight d4 is met by the mid c3, winning this knight, pinning and winning, as Walt Clyde Frazier would say. Uh, that's the New York Knicks commentator. So that's why, oh, you know, I'm, I'm learning. I'm learning new things every time I stream with Robert. I mean, I hope so. Otherwise, it wouldn't be so rewarding, right? If you're not learning anything, then I just feel like you're, I'm doing a terrible job. No, it's a constant progress. We are evolving as commentators and people, hopefully, are hu as human beings. Yeah, Volga. I mean, this is, this is the third game where I really like their chances. So 
I can't believe it. I thought that the Tbilisi gentlemen were just uh, winning the match in a very confident manner. But in this last round, it looks like the Russian players are coming up with their A game and they are definitely showing the Georgians that they are here to fight for that team victory. They can still turn the tables. Yeah, and Volkov is going to be the hero, it looks like, for the Tbilisi gentleman because all of a sudden his position looks good. He's up a pawn in an endgame. There's no way he can lose this with the white pieces, so I'm not sure at all what happened. I'm going to scroll back a little bit. I guess Black gave up his entire queen side. That probably, hmm. wait, that probably wasn't ideal there. Yeah, he, he gave up his entire queen side, and now white is the one up a pawn. They drew the game because opposite colored oh. bishops. But that's important for the Tbilisi gentlemen because with that draw, they have at least achieved a tie, eight points. Yeah, no, eight points. So that is... They only need one more draw to win the match. And that puts a lot of psychological pressure on yeah. the Stormbringers because when you have a chance at, you know, seven and a half, four and a half, you're like, okay, at least one draw can happen. Now you know no more draws mm -hmm. can happen. So it's not like take yeah, your pick, we'll no try to press our advantage. It's like all or nothing. So... Yeah, I think this is looking very, very good for the gentleman. But in this particular game between Paichadze and Briakin, I picked Paichadze for my fantasy chess team, which means he's not going to win. But like rook c, no, rook c6 blunder is the queen of e8 check. Nice move, rook e3. It's sort of a, hmm. you're clearing the square for your queen to give this check. I like it. I, like, I don't see a follow-up here for black. I mean, my king is not exactly in pure safety on the g6 square. Rook e3. I really like this move, too, is to bring the rook over. Uh, it can be an attacking piece coming to the h5, also to the c file, simply just to protect these squares on the third rank. And uh, as Robert said, what is the follow-up? Because the rook on, from e3 is cutting the connection between the g5 queen and the d2 pawn. So now you can't just freely move away the d6 rook. King h7 Whoa. is interesting because now the rook from the sixth rank can move over to h6, but rook e8, yeah. The rook h8 is a threat. So rook h8 followed by queen e8 check and checkmating ideas, right? So let's just make a random move like rook uh, d four, then rook h8 check, queen e8 check, king f6 only move, rook f8 would be check and mate because the queen covers all the remaining squares. So that is actually a checkmate threat. It's not just a check on h8. Yes, indeed. Shout out to Grandmaster Jon Ludwig Hammer who is here with us in the chat. Hammer will be covering the gnomes matches. So that is coming up next after our broadcast is over. Alexandra Botes and Danny Ranch will be here to stream the central division of the Pro Chess League with the Norway gnomes being one of the participants. And of course, we all love uh, the best Norwegian streamer, Grandmaster Jon Ludwig Hammer who will be live from the chess pub that is a new pub in Oslo. I still need to visit it. It's just such an epic place, a pub that is dedicated to chess in the center of Oslo. Yeah, no, that's amazing. I actually really want, I've never been to Norway, period, but that in really? particular seems oh, fascinating. Oh, you should visit Norway. I've been to, no I, I visited Norway for the first time last year, and then I doubled it down because I went to the Fisher Random match between Magnus and Hikaru, and then the Norway Chess Tournament, the Atibox Norway Chess. Um, it's an amazing place, an amazing place. And what Norway does for chess, wow. So the Good Night is a pub. Good Night, written with Night as K N I G H T. That is a chess pub in Oslo. You guys got to visit it if you are in Oslo. Yeah, no, for sure. I, at some point, I'll have to get there. Hey, Perpetual Stamate, thanks for giving us a wave to us over there in the chat. But I, I need to get there at some point, for sure. And this position is just, I don't know what to say about it anymore. I'm confused. I was, I thought this. <laughs> Who is better and why? Yeah, I mean, like white is trying to go for all these checks. A queen h7 check with queen g8 check back. It looks like the black kings gonna have a hard time escaping. But if this king can find some semblance of shelter, black should be doing very well. In fact, rook e4 is one of those moves where like, I might just be getting checkmate after rookie four because queen h7 mm -hmm. check. If I go to f7, queen g8 check back. I can't go to e7 because then queen e 8s mate. The king just has nowhere to escape to. The rook and queen remove those escape squares. So I don't want to go up the board to g5, but maybe I can even try something like this. It looks ridiculous and I probably get checkmated anyway, but I don't know. Black can't afford to make a draw because then the team loses. 
Yeah, he cannot. He has to be playing for a win. That is the situation. Eight points for the gentleman. Any half a point, any draw uh, on the remaining three boards will mean a team victory for the Georgians. That is, all the Russians have to go for a win. They cannot afford to make a draw. That is what Robert was emphasizing. And this is a real tough situation when your team cannot afford to make a single half point because it's all in. Yeah. You gotta go all in. And you're no longer playing chess. You're playing like a more subjective game, which is tough. And mm -hmm. I pulled up the Andrekin game. Jabawa, in fact, has gotten out of it and will be up a pawn. So it looks like it's all over for Volga anyway because Jabawa just won. I don't know how he did this. He's a miracle worker. He, well, okay. Andrekin went pawn to e4, sacrificing that pawn, and then hoped to get it back, which he did. But the problem was he gave his b6 square to the black king. So even though Jabawa temporarily went down a pawn by giving up the c5 pawn, once king b6 happened, you lose b5, and b5 actually wins two pawns because you take b5 and then a6 falls next. So a very nicely played transition here by Jabawa, who can never lose an endgame of, of this sort. So very nice by him, which means that it's all gentlemen in this matchup. Yeah, uh, turn of events in this game. Dimitri Andrakin had a better end game earlier, and then uh, Jobava managed to flip the position, and now he has an advantage to play for a win. But that means that this match will be over because Jobava, as Robert pointed it out, he cannot lose this position unless he blunders his rook. Uh, a player of this level is not going to make a one move blunder, especially with four minutes on the clock. So that is not even time pressure for Black. Yeah, yeah, no, this is. Clear that Jabawa is going to be, if anything, pressing for a win, though it should end up fizzling out into a draw. And I think that's what he's... Oh, actually, this is a nice move A4, because if you have king B4, then I have rook D4 check, and I win your F4 pawn, which simultaneously wins a pawn and protects the F7 square. So Yeah, that would have been a nice move. He now pushes A4. Uh, I just wanted to thank, once again, everyone who has tuned in. We are not going anywhere, but I so appreciate you guys here on Twitch and on Chess TV watching the broadcast of the Pro Chess League. This has been Robert and me covering the Eastern Division of the Pro Chess League Week 5. And after we are done, it's going to be Alexandra Botas and Danny Rensch broadcasting this Central Division with the Norway Nose being one of the teams playing from the good night chess pub in oslo that is one of the top teams of the central division and it's just amazing to have you guys here every single week next week too there will be process league it's every week two days so we are on air twice a week with the process league get some get some process league love in the twitch chat i'm gonna use my process league logo emote and also for robert who is my amazing co-host some bagel some bagel love I appreciate that. I'm going to have to give you some emote love right now as well because, well, where are the... Oh, chess come on uh, right here. Just... Oh, no, I'm going to use then the Robert emote. BJ, thank you so much. Benjamin has the golden Anna emote. That's a very unique emote that I think Benjamin is the only person in the world who has access to it. Well, then now I kind of want it. How do I get it? Well, whose Twitch do I have to follow? <laughs> Well, Benjamin is the only one. Okay, fine. I'll let it. I'll let it be. <laughs> I'll let it be. You gotta be special to have it. Okay. Well, I'm not special, but I think it's like tier three. I don't even know how you get it. So I, I have it among my emotes, but I think it's like tier three subscription. Okay, I'll need to do that then. I'm just trying to figure this out. Someone goes, "Why is Robert looking to his right? Multiple monitors. That's why. Got to you know be checking out everything that's going on here. If I could only look to." <laughs> straight in front of me that I'm not looking at everything going on. If you want me to ignore you in the Twitch chat, then I will stop looking to my right. But chess, chess, chess. Where is this last match between Estonia and... Uh, okay, there it is. Rosco Phoenix, it's a tie so far, 6-6 six, six going into the last round. And in the meantime, you can see that the Twisted gentlemen have indeed won the match. It's eight and a half already, eight and a half, five and a half. Yep, eight and a half is the critical score. And so we've had three victors thus far, Mumbai, Armenia, Tbilisi. And right now, Moscow, the other Moscow team, there are two of them, there's the Wizards and the Phoenix. The Phoenix and the Horses. This is the only matchup left. And thankfully for us, Anna, it's very exciting because it's six to six, which means that one slip up will result in a lost match or, you know, mm -hmm. craziness can ensue and it will ensue, especially as we have lower and lower on the clock. And I'm looking at this Jan Elvis game Jan had that beautiful win earlier with that rook b7 move. 
Now he's playing on the white side of what looks like a crazy position where he's up a pawn. Black is not castled, but the rook on c8 is well placed. Okay, he went c3 to stop my entire point. And here, you know, the a2 pawn is hanging, but is black getting checkmated? The e5 square looks like a nice temporary location for the knight, but at some point is that knight going to get removed? All these things are coming to mind, and I just can't be certain that black is not just going to be facing a really devastating attack with queen g3 coming soon as well. Yeah, that's looking very promising. And once again, it has been the theme of the day, a king, in, a king in the middle of the board. You usually want to castle, place your king in a safe place. And castling does that normally to the king when you have the hg and f pawns intact. They are just there bodyguarding your king. But the king here, the black king on e8, hasn't managed to castle. And even if he had castled, the g file is already open. So this is not an ideal situation for the safety of the king. And that is the objective of the game of chess, to give mate to the opponent's king. So looking after your king is high priority. And f5 doesn't look like it keeps an eye on your king, but the good thing about f5, right, is that you actually make some space for king to run away to f7, and this knight on e5 is gonna stay here for a while. I have two minor pieces defending the square, and you only have a minor piece and a queen attacking. So unless you can get your knight from e4 to attack that square, my knight will just sit on e5 for a while. Now, taking on b4, um, can I just... Hmm. Queen takes b4 back here? What's the idea? Yes, what? and the knight on e4 is hanging. Um, and then b2. I wonder if there's anything concrete in that position. It looks just so suspicious with the king being in the middle of the board. There are all sorts of tactical elements when the opponent's king is this vulnerable, but I don't see a concrete way right after queen takes b4. Yeah, that's a much better square. I was going to point out the queen takes a2 allows knight c5, which looks very scary, because now mm -hmm. I'm offering a trade of knights, and then the e6 pawn is very weak, the a6 pawn, etc. So the queen b4 certainly was the right move. Knight f2 going to d3, but king f7 here, perhaps? Just saying I'm going to get my king to protect this e6 pawn? I mean, I'm not so certain that black's not coming back here on a yeah um this could still be an exciting an exciting game even though i i thought that white was doing very well and i still love white's position but i don't see how to break through so yes the king is weak on e8 but so far black is doing a good job covering up on the e5 so this e5 knight prevents queen takes e6 and also the g6 square is covered with that knight now king f6 connecting the rooks it is a funny way to place your king in a somewhat safer location and also to develop the rook because the AJ rook you need to bring. You need to develop all your pieces. Yeah, and if they survive this game, it's really because this move F5. Very brave mm -hmm. move and a very good yeah. move. Like the pawn F7, you want to protect E6, but you can't keep your king on E8. You couldn't castle because the H6 pawn was always going to be captured. So this is making it a dynamic affair. And this rook can now swing to c2, and all of a sudden black is the one picking up momentum here. And I really think that if Jan Elvis doesn't sort of fix his position in the next couple moves, he might be on the much worse side of this as the um, tactics start coming under fire here. And I just gotta go to the other games as well because I'm looking at the game yeah. between Tuan Berg and Vladimir Zakhartsov, that is Max Schachmann and Dreamist. And I see a knight on d7, which always makes me think, is that knight coming to f6 with check? And I see a pass pawn on c6, but black is up three pawns. And He's up three pawns, but he doesn't have much time. So this can still be knight exciting b6. because of the time situation. Knight, knight, and also tactical elements. Yeah, knight, he, knight coming to... Knight b6, wait. right? Yeah, knight b6, and rook if c6. rook c8, then c7. Yeah, you know, if you move that rook away, definitely c7, I get a queen. But you're going to take me on c6, and I'm going to play rook e8 check, king f7, rook takes c6, king takes e8. But then I might have this intermediate move, not intermediate, but this knight takes d5 move, where your pawn on e6 is pinned to your rook on g6. So if white is able to capture that last a pawn and keep the knight on the board, that rook and knight position with the mm -hmm. a pawn would be close to winning. So knight b6 is one option. C7 might even be a better way to start, right, Anna? Because that way you can just play C7 and the knight B6 next. And how does black stop yeah. that, actually? Now, this is really tough. Uh, if, if we just count the pawns, material advantage for black, but at the same time, this C6 possible makes it so difficult for black to come up with something. I'm curious how this game will evolve after 97 rook G6. 
what must be calculating knight b6 or c7 immediately. Yeah, I guess c7, the fear is bishop takes d7, rook d7, rook g7. Oh, so not rook g7, rook mm -hmm. f6, pardon me. Rook g7 loses to rook d8 check. But rook f6, if you go rook d8, then I have rook f8 mm -hmm. protecting my rook on c8 with my rook. And if I can start doing something like that, I was, yeah. I was worried after rook f6 about rook g1 check and bringing my second mm -hmm. rook on the seventh rank. And that probably yeah. is winning, honestly. So maybe that is mm -hmm. something that Zahartsev will unleash in this position, but you need to calculate it. You can't just move instantly. Anna, you're the best thing that has ever happened to chess. That is what uh, uh, no, uh, that that is a very false statement. Uh, the best thing that has ever happened to chess is the Pro Chess League. Oh. This online competition that combines chess with esports, I think it's really such an such an exciting competition and bringing in the these this new kind of wave about streaming bringing more chess streams onto twitch so the pro chess league in itself has created a new wave of streamers because many of these teams have their own streams many of their players have their own channels so it has i think it has caused that the chess community on twitch has been growing partially because of the pro chess league and also because of course all the efforts of chess.com to combine chess with esports yep no you're absolutely right and also you know gotta give magnus carlson a shout out because he's amazing for the game of chess he's the world champion okay maybe he's also important yeah. for chess yeah king of i know that all the former world champions and all the inspiring players of course they it's just very difficult to highlight one thing but certainly not me <laughs> i disagree with you there but here okay so rook f6 why did king of three i don't know why that was played but c7 feels logical Oh, wait, C7? Yeah, and Chesby, by the way, if we are if we are naming someone, it's Chesby. Shout out to Chesby and all the things that she does for the chess community and Twitch. Yeah, she's definitely a, a great um, presence here in the chess community, absolutely. I'm going to use my Chesby emotes in the chat because I do love Chesby. She's amazing. Chesby, this is for you. This is a chess.com emote, and I'm going to use some of from my channel to this is this cowboy hat is for Chess Bay. I have the song I Want to Break Free stuck in my head and I have no idea why, but I was just, uh, I realized. Because this people wants to break free. Yeah, but it's not happening with King G8. Is, is this rook trapped here? Like King F8, King G8, are we just repeating the position? Mm, yes, that could be a way for black to escape. Wow, what a missed opportunity. King okay, but King, King G8, I would play Knight G4. Play knight g4. Oh, because they... to keep the game going. Whoa, no, don't do that. The hard stuff is repeating. Why? Because if you... Okay, we'll see if he just makes a draw here. King f8, rook h7, and that is a draw by repetition of moves. So if the position is repeated three times, that's a draw in chess. But it has to be the exact same position, not just the same piece or same move. Draw by repetition. Oh, on come the... on. You got to play on here. So after king yeah. j played knight g4, hitting this rook on f6 if you take my rook well then i'm going to take your bishop because king g6 knight e8 rook e8 and mm. now i finally get a queen my rook is protecting the queen square so knight g4 put that rook under attack if you move the rook somewhere i don't know where you're going to move it to but the point stands that if you go rook to g6 i can even play rook takes h6 or bring my rook back to e7 and then bring my rook on the e file so that was a missed opportunity for sure by vladimir zakhartsov thankfully for him his team is still in the lead Seven and a half, six and a half, and well, you're gonna have to hope that your team survives. And what is going on in this Jan Elvis yeah. game? One point Whoa. away, the Phoenix are one point away from winning, and Elvis. Whoa! What? The Rook last couple moves two. have been crazy. Yeah, they have traded queens in a very funny way. Rook takes d6, both queens were hanging, and now Rook c7. Oh, this looks. Pin on the seventh rank. Okay. Well, this is a pawn up for white to start with. Mm -hmm. And he also has quite some initiative with this pin on the seventh rank and very active pieces. It has to be a winning position for yeah. white unless he steps into some uh, fork because there are still knights on the board and the knight is such a dangerous piece. A4, A5, A6 feels like a pretty good plan. Yeah, supported by the pair of bishops. Ooh, like, I like the, that move though. Bishop F6? Yeah, because now you want to play bishop D8 and try to stop uh -huh. that pawn's progress. But if I go... Yeah, it can't go a5, bishop d8 looks good. Although, a5, bishop d8, a6, 
Like if you take my rook, oh, I go a7. I just took on h6 simply, the pawn. Okay, that's a... So nice two pawns are full white. Yeah, but uh, this still, I don't really care as much about the h1, because now bishop b6 is really going to annoy me. It pins my knight, threatens knight g4. Rook b6 wins the b3 pawn. I don't mm -hmm. think Elvis is going to win this game. I really don't think he's yeah. going to win this game. And you if might I be right, because now black is taking on b3, so he's going to get back one of the pawns. And uh, with the bishop on d8, he's controlling the a5 squared, so that you can't go and advance the a pass pawn further. Yeah, this is clear compensation. Um, so rook b1 check. It's coming. I mean, I just don't see what's Elvis happening. Elvis is all shook up. <laughs> yeah, they're using the lovely Elvis uh, references. I love Elvis. So I do appreciate these puns. But I don't like what El Elvis is doing here. <laughs> yeah, I also thought that A5, A6 earlier, the way of that past bomb was Wait. paved by the pair of bishops, but now... He's blundering, I think. Yeah, you know, I mean, now it's just bad, but rook b1 check was definitely a good move. Mm -hmm. Because rook b1 check, king h2, only move, bishop c7 check. If you go king h3, mm -hmm. then I go rook b3 check, and you're just getting your king mated. So yes. the pawn would have to go to g3, and then something like knight f6 comes into play, h5 pawn, g3 pawn. This was, both sides are missing opportunities here. So bishop a5, bishop b2, and now bishop mm -hmm. c7, hoping for a mate, but rook b1 check again was missed. Like, rook b1 check instead of bishop c7, you forced yeah, that Yeah, why did he not give that check? I don't know. And now we let the pawn push a little bit? This is... Like, you're, you're now in a passive defensive setup instead of going straight yeah. forward for an aggressive attack. So, yeah, I'm not really feeling what's been going on lately, but e4, e3 is an option here. Okay, rook c2 is a nice move, threatening rook c7. Straight to jailhouse for Elvis, blundering like a hound dog. <laughs> you guys are the best. Shout out to our Twitch community and also everyone watching on Chess TV. You guys really make this show a feast. I love broadcasting with Robert, but if it was only Robert and me and maybe um, Robert's mom and my mom watching, it would be a little lonely out here. Does your mom also watch your commentary? Sometimes, yes. and she doesn't speak English, so she just watches because she loves me too much. Oh, not too much. Definitely not too much. That's wow. that's adorable. Well, I, I shout out to your mom, Anna. So I I don't know if you thank you. you know. Thank you. I will have a family Skype after the stream, so I'm gonna tell her. <laughs> that's so adorable. I don't know how to handle it. Oh, nice tactic coming. Rook takes f6. Next move. King f7. Or king... Yay! And then a j bishop c3. Prepare your skewer emotes, guys. That is a tactical element in chess, and it's gonna be. Oof, a win for Elvis in the end. It has been a very exciting game with ups and downs, but now he is cashing in yeah. with the H-pawn. Well, now he's just winning a knight and then winning the H-pawn anyway. So this was a close match because Estonia is going to finish losing 7.5 to 8.5. So, you know, it's as close as you can come, obviously, without making a tie, and he wins by resignation. It's been close, but the Phoenix have won the match already regardless the game of Elvis so Elvis on his way to win this game but it doesn't matter anymore because the Phoenix have scored eight and a half already that will mean eight and a half seven and a half victory for the Russian team but in the other match the Stormbringers uh, lose to the Tbilisi gentlemen so the standings will be very similar to how it started before this round because the top play the top two teams at least the Tbilisi gentlemen and the Armenia Eagles have secured their top spot with today's win yeah some more Elvis some more Elvis puns in the chat and remember that this has been the Eastern Division but the Central Division is coming up next with Alexandra Botes and Danny Ranch actually and some of the players will be streaming Anna there's, there's a surprise for you Anna oh. uh, Alexandra apparently um wasn't feeling so great, so she is not doing the commentary, but you will see. I will let you be surprised by who the <gasps> co-commentator is. But Oh, she's not feeling well. No, no that, that's sad news, but I'm now, now you're curious. really curious who will be Danny's co-host. I, I can't tell you, but all I know is that I'm supposed to end this ASAP. So I'm sorry to, Ooh, to leave so quickly, whoa. but I know that um, Danny and the team is getting ready to start their show. So, Anna? It's been an absolute pleasure. You know I love doing commentary with you. I hope 
we partner up sometime soon. I pr I'm sure we will. But um, do you have any final thoughts about this matchup, these uh, matchups here in the Eastern Division and anything else? Absolute honor, Robert, as usual. Thank you for shaving for today. <laughs> for next time, I also want the beard look, so I, I get both the best of Robert has with both looks. Shout out to our Twitch community, everyone on Chess TV too, and just stay here for the next division. I can't wait to see who is the other host yeah. for the Central Division. Yep. So thank you, everybody. Um, we're signing off here, and uh, have a great day. Don't go anywhere, because the Central oh, yeah. Division will be on shortly.